Welcome to Senate Education this Valentine's Day, February 14th at 1.30. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, we're looking for our candy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want me, do you want me to go steal some from another room? I can. No, I think it might be infected. That's true. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Reaction to it, right? Oh, that's right. That's yeah. weird. Yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, look at S fifty six today, which many of you are familiar with. This is the pre K bill, uh, and this is something that. Uh, we're just still learning a little bit about. We had some overview from last week with, uh, it was maybe it was the week prior, uh, Sarah Kenny and Allison Westman? Richards. Richards, thank you. I've known her forever. Uh, Allie Richards. And so we're going to start with that. We're then going to hear from Heather, and we're going to have a couple of people in to start to just understand the pre K impact that some providers might experience. Our jurisdiction, if we so choose to work on it this term, which I think people will want to in some capacity, is the pre-K piece, the part that interacts with public schools. But I'll look to the three of you also for anything you want to weigh in on it. And I think Senator Gulick is uh, serving as the liaison between the two committees. Um, I, I don't know if it's uh, I think it's a paid position. I don't know for sure. <laughs> it's certainly a paid position. Thanks for the So no, so everybody we can sort of go back and forth uh, and everybody can share what they're interested in. Then we're going to hear from any, anyhow, we're going to close some loops on the educational quality standards which have come up a number of times in committee. Uh, Dr. Sharon Howell is coming back at Senator Gulick's request to talk about uh, her questions regarding educational quality standards in Act 173. Uh, and then we are going to, everyone should know, the libraries at Vermont State Colleges. I know everybody's been getting a lot of emails about those. Uh, the president and provost will be weighing in and kind of giving us an update on what's happening there. And then we will shift to Senator uh, Gulick, uh, and she will take us through a little bit of her uh, school construction bill. Then we have chairs meetings and uh, a bunch of other meetings this afternoon. So, Ms. St. James, committee, in your folders, you will find a copy of S56, the section that we have jurisdiction over. So with that, if you would give us a kind of a, an overview, um, I'd say medium level, not super high, but some detail. And we'll then hear from, we have people coming in, I think, from Wyndham County, Bennington, and Addison County. Uh, so with that, Ms. St. James. Thank you, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, is the, would it be helpful for the committee to understand how pre-K works now? Or is that something that you're all familiar with? Why don't you fill us in? OK, just very great. high level. Yep. Um, the pre-K section in Title 16 is in the same chapter as the town tuition program. It's Section 829. And currently, it allows, uh, it provides for publicly funded uh, pre-kindergarten education for students, uh, for children between the ages of three and five if they are not yet enrolled in kindergarten, um, for 10 hours a week during the school year. And that, um, uh, that money can be used in a public pre-K program that is run by the school district, or it can be used in a private pre-K program um, that qualifies as a pre-qualified pre-kindergarten education provider. So that's very basic. So right now, 10 hours a week during the school year. Um, and it can be either public or private. And the and, money file follows the children's, the child. So for example, am I accurate in saying if you can bring your kid to your, if there's one right near your office, there's, there are no district lines? No, there is a provision in current law that allows for there to be geographical limitations created on where uh, children can uh, obtain their pre-kindergarten education. 
Um, I am not aware from the field whether that section is in use, whether okay. there are any of those geographical areas. Um, they are called, you'll see it's a large section of this bill. It's a strikeout of all of that language. Yeah. But it's called geographic limitations, and it um, allows school boards to limit the geographic boundaries. Um, school boards themselves. Yeah. So again, it goes through our tuitioning program, which of course we'll be learning more about as we delve into other bills. But this is similar to our school choice program. There are some similarities. When you say school choice, do you mean high school cho school choice or the town uh, tuition program? Town tuition program. Um, uh, I hesitate to say yes, but yes, in that um, parents get to choose where their children go okay. within some limitations, right? It has to be a pre-qualified pre-kindergarten uh, pre education provider, so there okay. is some regulation of them. It's not yeah. just any program. Can it be a religious place? If they are uh, pre-approved. Pre-approved. Okay. Um, 10 hours during the school year, um, and then private programs can charge, uh, you know, they have to, there's special provisions in there about um, how that money is allocated to the private programs and how it's spread throughout, uh, how private programs can charge families for the rest of the school year if they're there. It also, current law is for children ages three to five if they're not yet in kindergarten. Yeah, same weeks. Um, is there a federal poverty level index associated with the, the funding? Every student, placement? every every student in the school district from three to five qualifies for ten hours a week, and the rate is set. It's not um, in current law. It is not the same as the town tuition program, where it's per pupil spending or right. um, an average per pupil spending if you're going to a, a, a private school. Um, it's a rate that's uh, specifically set. Um, and updated based on an inflator. Um, and that's just, again, just for 10 hours a week during the school year. So that's pre-K now, very, yeah. very high level. Um, <clears throat> Pre-K has also historically been um, regulated because of uh, the allowance of uh, private providers. Um, has been regulated jointly between AOE and um, DCF. Okay. This bill, S-56, I've um, suggested that Hayden link to the whole bill, because I do think it's important to have the context. But um, I will be walking you through the first, oh, 24-ish pages today. Um, and that's what we have in front of us just So yeah, and so I also provided just those pages yeah, for the you. printout. Um, what this bill does at a very high level, and I will walk you through not line by line, but kind of concept by concept, is it proposes to do a bunch of different things related to the Department of Children and Family Services that we are not going to talk about today. Um, I actually only worked on the most of the section we are going to be talking about today. The rest of this bill, actually the whole bill, was really drafted by Katie McClinn. And so if you're interested in anything other than what we're talking about today, I highly, highly recommend having her here. We like to appear together at all possible times, but we are unable to make that work this week. Um, but this if is, I may, just mm -hmm. to give people some historical context, I was on the committee when we passed this in the House, which must have been 12, 13 years ago. And, uh, and I'm looking to Ms. Kenny if you want to weigh in if I get any of this wrong. Our, our intention at that point was completely ex exactly what kind of rolled out, the 10 hours. I think the part that kind of surprised some of us, or speaking for myself, is that it ended up not always helping low-income Vermonters, uh, because a lot of people didn't just need 10 hours. They needed a lot more than that. And so it, it again, just my a little, some anecdotal comments I remember hearing from families and others was, you know, if you can afford the 20 or 30, then yeah, you're getting an extra 10, which is great. But if you can't afford anything, this might not, the 10 itself might not be reaching as many people as it needs to. Ms. Kenny, do you want to say anything about that? I don't know. Um, and that's just sort of some committee experience, sort of pre and post. 
Yeah, I'll let you all talk okay. through the details of the bill. I think you're right, it was, I think, 2013 when the yeah. legislation passed it, effective 2014, voluntarily, yeah. and then yeah. 2016, and um, 10 hours was restrictive for some families. Yeah. Although lower income families can qualify for child care financial assistance program support to okay. be able to layer on top of that at, at a private partner program, yeah. not necessarily yeah. in school. Basically. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. So at a very high level, what this bill proposes to do to pre-kindergarten education is, and I'm going to just simplify it very basically, it redefines pre-kindergarten education as for uh, four through five-year-olds, again, five if you're not yet in kindergarten, and it requires every school district to either provide a pre-K program or to pay tuition to another public pre-K program in a different school district for the entire school year, for a whole school day. So um, pre-K required to happen, or required to be either maintained or tuitioned out, yeah. whole school year, whole school day. Um, what's, what, what's the time frame considered by definition for a full school day? Excellent question. So let's, um, uh, it's in the bill, but I will just answer that quickly. Um, section 1071 of uh, Title 16 um, requires that students in public schools be in attendance for 175 days a year, 175 days of student attendance. Um, and then it, allows the State Board of Education to set the minimum for the school day, the length of the school day. And the State Board does that by different grade levels, right? A, a full day for a kindergartner may look different than a full day for an 18-year-old. And then it allows school districts working with that minimum to set the length of the day for their school district. So they can't go below the minimum, um, but it's up to the school district to set the, the day. So there's, um, that's as specific as the law gets. Okay. So it is kind of paid then. Thank you. I will say that is as specific as the law gets. Okay. There is a lot of, if you look at the State Board of Education rules, I believe for kindergarten right now, the minimum amount of time that a child can be in school and it count as a student attendance day is two hours a day or 10 hours a week aggregate. That's the minimum. Now, each school district is going to define what a kindergarten day is for their district, working with that minimum. So, if we um, start on um, page two, there's some. Um, Uh, it starts with a kind of a conforming uh, change to section 11 in Title 16, which is the big definition section. So it's amending the definition of early childhood education um, to um, exclude pre-kindergarten education from that definition. And then it's defining pre-kindergarten education and referring to section 829, which is the pre-kindergarten education section, which will have the definitions in it. Um, the other big piece of the pre-K section is that it proposes to create a new deputy secretary within the agency of education to solely manage the division of student support services, which will govern special education, early education, and multi-tiered systems of support. So that's a, that would be a brand new position um, and a brand new division of responsibility within AOE. Um, there is a conforming change on page three. Um, this was uh, in the access to criminal records section um, that applies to schools. And this is removing this language because it was with respect to private pre-kindergarten programs. And this bill, um, uh, doesn't do away with them. It allows a private provider to have a, a private pre-kindergarten program mm -hmm. um, 
but it wouldn't be publicly funded and it would be um, not referred to as pre-kindergarten education. Um, it would be early education. So parents can still send their children to, to a private program under this bill. They would just be paying out of pocket for that. So section um, four on page four is the meat of this um, proposed changes. So section 829, as I mentioned, is the pre-kindergarten education um, section in Title 16. This is really it for pre-K. It's not like it spans multiple different sections in Title 16. Um, so you'll see that it starts by with a definition section and there's a bunch of amendments proposed. So the first amendment is to the definition of pre-kindergarten child. So um, it's, you can see that it was formerly three or four years of age or five, but not yet in kindergarten, and this is proposing to change it to four, um, to five. Um, I'm not gonna go over every specific change, so if you see new language or, or language that is struck through that I am not speaking to, please um, let me know if you wanna go over it. But the big change here is the um, definition of public pre-kindergarten education program. So we're repealing pre-qualified private provider because that's not a, a thing anymore um, in this section. So public pre-kindergarten education means the provision of high quality, publicly funded, <coughs> excuse me, full day pre-kindergarten education at a public school, which is available to pre-kindergarten children either within a child's district of residence or paid for by a child's district or residence if the district does not maintain an elementary school. Yeah. As a as legal uh, so legislative counsel, is it in, in this definition of uh, public pre-kindergarten education program, in that definition, they introduce the concept of high, high quality, but without caveat. Is, and, but I know from our other committee that that's a, that's a meaty topic. And I'm just curious, um, you know, if, if, I don't know, if it's uh, appropriate to introduce, you know, that, that kind of measure without introducing its uh, ramifications. That would be a policy choice. There's nothing legally wrong with ambiguous terms. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, that's fair. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be, um, th this bill does not define high quality. Um, so that would be a policy choice on okay. how granular right. you get with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you. so, so, follow up question. This bill doesn't define high quality, but high quality is defined in somewhere else. Are you asking or telling me? I'm asking. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. If it were, it would be referenced to it. Yeah, but we, we went over that in health and welfare. The five. Are you thinking it's an yeah. either part I'm thinking of, of the STARS time? program. Right. And yeah, but STARS goes away. With this. Okay, gotcha. Right. All right. So they can't reference something they're going to repeal. Okay, gotcha. No, oh, that's helpful. Yeah. It's Senator Williams. Okay. No, so I think just okay. 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 There are other uh, uh, requirements you'll see built in. Um, I'm just saying that the term high quality is not defined in Section 829. Whether it's defined in DCF rules or is a part of another requirement, I can't speak to today. Right. Um, but the, those two, that phrase is not defined in this section specifically. Right. Um, so subsection B on page four, line 19, is access to, it used to be publicly funded pre-kindergarten education program. And this subsection will spell out um, kind of what, what parents, what children have access to. Um, and so you'll see that there's a proposed amendment that we're taking publicly funded out and we're labeling it a public pre-kindergarten education program. So each school district that maintains an elementary school for its resident students shall maintain a full-time public pre-kindergarten education program which shall be available to each pre-kindergarten child whom a parent or guardian wishes to enroll. Each public pre-kindergarten education program shall operate for, us, for the school year as defined in section 1071 of this title. That goes back to 175 days a year, of student attendance. Um, a school district that does not maintain an elementary school and does not maintain a public pre-kindergarten education program shall pay tuition for its resident students 
to attend a public pre-K program outside the district. So if you are a school district that maintains an elementary school, you have a brick and mortar, yeah. this bill requires you to also add pre-K to that. And if you don't have a brick and mortar, it requires you to pay tuition. You'll see later that there is also a provision that allows a school district that does not maintain an elementary school to make the choice to stand up a pre-K program on its own without having to pay tuition. Yeah. Just curious, like, we're out of the definition, no, we're still in the definition section, is that right? No, we're in, um, we're in the access section. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm just curious, like, to what extent this mandates, like, how many students does a mandate would be served by this program? I mean, it's like, Every Whole student lot. in the district. Okay, so where's the private? Where's the, you know, if this is public private, where's the private? You there know, is no put, more, this bill takes away the private option. Only public. For, for, um, for, for publicly for funded parent. pre K. Okay. All right. Again, okay. I have, I did not, I am not speaking to any of the child care components to this bill today. Um, Which you've all covered. In health and welfare, I suspect. Yes. Senator yes. Yeah. So this again is four-year-olds and five-year-olds, pre-K program, public, and uh, again, it would preclude somebody from using their own dollars to go to an independent, private uh, pre-K program. And yes. We'll hear from some of those folks, but. Um, the, this would end the days of using those public dollars to go to private pre-K providers, four and five girls. Correct. Yeah. So we're going to put those private providers on this, basically. Well, well, I don't know if you've taken any testimony on this in health and welfare, this no, issue? Not, not okay. Not yeah, yeah. Okay. So we will uh, hear from some of those uh, today. and. Um, Start jumping in. Yes, I do. I just want to, I mean, I hear your question, but there's still, there's still the K to four year olds. The, I mean, the K, the, the birth to, the birth to four year olds right. who will need sure. child care. Just, yeah. 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 Not K. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. Uh, Ms. St. James, I'm also looking at Ms. Kenny because I didn't schedule enough time for this, obviously. Uh, how much time do you think you need to walk us through this? Because we do, it's interesting, with childcare and early childhood educators, kids are waking up from naps, kids need to be fed, mm -hmm. and so they are on a different kind of schedule. Yes, yeah, so I, I, you have the general idea of this. Yeah. <clears throat> I would say, again, depending on questions, another 20 minutes to walk through okay. all of the language. Okay. Um, but the main takeaways is creating a new deputy secretary mm -hmm. within AOE and a new di new division, new responsibilities yeah. there, and changing the program from 10 hours a week in public or private of choice yeah. to for three to five year olds to public funds can only be used from ages four to five if you're not yet in kindergarten in publicly funded and established pre-K programs, um, and it requires school districts who already have an elementary school to start the pre-K program in their district. And if they don't have an elementary school, they tuition out, similar to the town tuition program. Yep. But there is a provision that allows non-operating districts to stand up a pre-K program. Um, that's, the, that's the big no, that's, overarching that's helpful. program. That's helpful. There's smaller nuances. Um, we will absolutely have you back. So. Let's take some questions on the overarching. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I have a vague question because I received a vague concern from somebody. Uh, but there, there was some questions as to the definition because, as it relates to federal funding that comes into the state. And I was wondering if you know anything about that because I, I wasn't able to get much detail. I don't. I think okay. that would be a great question for my colleague, Katie, who um, really works in this area um, and has drafted the bulk of this bill. I don't know if there are any conversations around that. Okay, thank you. So, do we have enough teachers to do this? 
I mean, that's a that's my concern. Is that where are they going to take the people that are running private daycare and put them in employ of the elementary school? We we, we know we got a teacher shortage. Yeah, that's a legitimate question. And it would, if something like this were to go through, and I'm hearing just anecdotally, it could take years to put something like this in place. But we haven't taken testimony. Uh, it, we would have to kind of maybe simultaneously ramp up with UVM, the state colleges, and other other people. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I think to that point, that was something I was thinking about too. But I think. You know, we, we, we have been here. There's a lot of different things that go into the mix of creating the teacher shortage. Um, and I think that when it comes to the workforce in general, you know, the two major things are housing and child care. And I think that when you start, when, when there's greater opportunity for teachers who have kids to send them to pre-K, um, you know, it creates a little bit more of a draw to come to Vermont. So, yeah, good point. The other big piece that I want to mention um, uh, is that this bill also proposes changing the weight for a pre-kindergarten child for education funding. So, um, if, have you had education funding 101? Okay. So you'll know that um, different uh, grades are weighted differently. Mm -hmm. In current law, pre-K is weighted kind of negatively. It's every every pre-K child is given a .54 weight. Elementary school students through grade five are um, neutral, they're weighted one. So this bill proposes to put them on par with the elementary students and weight them at one. Okay. So to repeal the negative um, 0.54 uh, weight and um, just make them on par with elementary students. Page 19. Yeah, we'll find 20 minutes, hopefully tomorrow, to do the more detailed walkthrough. But that's a very helpful overview. And would you bring Ms. Otis and Ms. Uh, Ruth and uh, Ms. January in? Thank Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Hey, Allison. Hello. Hello. Uh, how are you? Good. 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 Good to see you. Oh, oh, oh. We got there we go. Oh, oh. It's like the Brady Bunch. Just <laughs> uh, the order we have on here is uh, we have Stacy Otis, then Allison, and then Linda. Ms. Otis, I understand that you have kids waking up from naps, and uh, so we want to go to you first and uh, hear your thoughts, uh, your early thoughts on the pre-kindergarten piece of this bill. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to go first. Um, so just a little um, insight into everything. I'm Stacey Otis, and I have operated a registered family child care in Springfield for 17 years and have been a public pre-K partner with the local school district for almost 10 years. Um, I opened my childcare out of necessity as my husband and I had four children, three of which were under six years old who needed childcare um, and we could no longer afford childcare. We both had worked outside of the home and received uh, CCFAP funds for several years when we qualified to 80% coverage. The state had done an update to the levels and we dropped down to 10% coverage and we happened to fall into the 3% of families that had a negative effect. Um, <clears throat> the cost of care was gonna be $315 and I was bringing home $330 a week. So um, I originally was only going to run my childcare until my youngest went to kindergarten and she is now a sophomore in college. So I have stayed. <laughs> um, I obtained my associate's degree in early childhood education through CCV while working almost 60 hours a week raising a family and will graduate with my bachelor's degree this year um, again, working full time while obtaining it. Um, thank you. I am a member mm -hmm. of the Vermont Task Force for Advancing as Profession and have worked hard to advocate for changes in the child care system. So I would like to thank you for putting a bill forward with a focus on child care because of the crisis for families and early childhood educators that we're currently having. Um, having a property tax break for family child care homes would be helpful in deferring some of our expenditures. And setting the CCFAP rates based on cost of care instead of market rates would be a huge help for families and early childhood educators. Um, as when families don't qualify, I often take a cut in pay because I know how hard it is uh, when they can't afford to pay childcare. Um, 
and this is why access for families is so important. So the 450% of federal poverty level income adjustment um, just doesn't seem enough. It needs to be raised to 500% for the middle income from Rogers so they don't fall off a huge cliff. Um, universal pre-K works best in a mixed delivery system as we have it now in Vermont. And I have a close relationship with my community public school that is fostered by the licensed teacher who comes into my program as my UPK mentor. Uh, the system provides families with many options as they decide what type of care they want for their children, as some prefer the smaller groups that family child cares offer. Uh, if, as, if they have multiple younger children, it definitely makes it easier to drop off and pick up in one place before and after work. Um, they don't have to worry about finding care for snow days, school vacations, and in-service days, and especially for the summer, as we would have the full-time care. Uh, we often find this issue already in my town with the Head Start program. We start getting frantic phone calls uh, in April for parents looking for childcare in the summer for their children, and we just can't take them. Um, being a registered home provider, the regulations say I can only have six children under the age of five or under school age. And of those six, only two can be under the age of two. Uh, if we lose four-year-olds from our care, we can't just replace them with babies. And having all four-year-olds in a public school would have a drastic negative effect on programs like mine. The numbers just don't work and could lead to closures of programs not being able to fill slots. Um, and I know that's the opposite of what we're hoping to do with this bill. A lot of us have worked hard to get the education needed to become pre-K qualified so that we can provide this service to our families. Although it is only required to offer 10 hours of pre-K a week, pre-K learning exists in everything we do all day long. Uh, even for the younger kids, as they're learning from watching the older kids, and oftentimes the older children will imitate what we have done during pre-K with the younger children. You know, sometimes they'll take a book that we've recently read and then they'll read it to the kids, you know, the younger kids. Um, the mix of ages is a key part of the high quality care that we provide in family child care. And it would be detrimental to our program to lose four-year-olds. So again, I would like to express my appreciation for putting a child care bill forward. And thank you for your time today. Yes, uh, and I believe this is your senator, um, correct? Uh, senator? Springfield, right, right at the board. Right senator board. White and Clarkson and McCormick, but um, or for Windsor. But you know, my my thought after hearing this, maybe this is something we can talk about. But can private pre-K businesses contract with schools that may not have capacity or may not have the staff to open up their own pre-Ks in the schools? That's something that we can explore for the purpose of trying to keep as many private pre-K facilities open? That's interesting. So you're saying uh, if you're elementary school A, you would contract with Ms. Otis's center yeah. as a public pre-K uh, option. Yeah. I don't think that would be allowed under the bill, but we can, I'm, I'm certainly open to it. Yeah, because the last thing I would want to see as a collateral consequence of this bill right, right, is right. to have any pre-K um, or any child care providers go under. Right, um, right. So it's not, I mean, it's fair to say it's not written that way currently. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. But it's something to talk about. Did, yeah. yeah. Um, her testimony had me thinking about it. So, yeah. yeah. Kind of goes back to what I said yeah. before about if these people can't compete or don't work for the where you got the people who are doing the same. Yeah. So, yeah. Same deal. Since we're brainstorming, yeah. I'll just throw this out. Um, could some pre K, private pre K providers become certified to be pre K teachers in a public school? Yes? Well, are you answering that? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to actually a partial answer possibly to Stacy's point. So, Stacy went out and got an associate's degree to be able to run her center. The new bill requires, I believe this is correct, her to have a bachelor's to run you know, the center. Isn't the lead a bachelor's? I don't believe so. But the I'm health centers are associates. That's high quality. That's the goal, but the bill does not require that. It's that's a, like part two is the supporting people to move to advance in their credentials the way that. So right. So it does have a good professional development element to it, which that's, that's certainly. But to Stacy's. To, to Stacy's circumstances, she she worked after hours. She got her associates. Now she's out of the business because she needs now she needs a bachelor. She saw she's almost got her bachelor's. Too. She's almost got her bachelor's. Okay, okay what I'm saying, I'm just saying that you know it's uh, 
to, to the point of you know uh, what 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 requirements what requirements there are to, to run these centers versus uh, proposed versus current. Ms. Owens has actually been part of the group that's working on that, so she might be a great person to speak but, to what the sort of the move to for credentials for folks in early education. Do you want to say something about that, Ms. Otis? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last bit of that. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, credentialing. So you moved to, you're finishing a bachelor's degree right now. Can you just Correct. say something, of maybe what motivated you to get the bachelor's degree? Is this just, not just, but is this part of your sort of professional, personal development? Uh, is, it, is it in any way connected to uh, your program itself uh, and the, the quality that you offer? Can you just say something about your motivation? Sure, I mean, it's a little bit of all of that. Um, to go to school, you know, finish my bachelor's, it was always a thing that I told my children, you know, college, this, you know, you need these papers sometimes for certain jobs. Um, and I had never done that, so I did that now. And I am working with Advancing as a Profession where we're really trying to get the high quality and showing that associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, you know, to run our programs. Um, to do this and knowing that potentially this is where it was leading. Um, so my degree is in early childhood studies and it doesn't lead straight to licensure for teacher licensure so that it would be another process that I would have to do um, through currently what Vermont has is the peer review system um, if I wanted to go that route with getting a license. And I believe that's what's required, that's what's required to run a full pre-K program on my own um, which is why I, I mentor with a licensed teacher right now as a smaller program. Um, and it's, it's not easy, you know, to go back to school, especially when we're working, you know, as a small program, it's just me. I'm the only one working here and I'm working 50, 60 hours a week just with children. So that doesn't include, you know, the college courses I'm doing, the, the um, curriculum setting and, you know, the planning and all of that stuff. Um, so it, it's not easy for everyone to do, um, and especially if you're not used to online courses, which can be tough. Down in Springfield, we don't have any colleges close to me that I could go in person to. So it's, you know, I was with an online course is all I could do, um, which I think is most of Vermont and many places in Vermont anyway. Um, so I don't know if that answers quite your question. I do believe that that is the route we're going. And I know in my area, um, the network that I run, there's 14 of us in the network and over half have already obtained their associates and a quarter of us are working on our bachelors. So, um, you know, we, we know this is what we wanna do. We wanna provide the best care possible for the children. And in order to compete also and keep our businesses with um, centers or even with the school districts. Yes. That was one of the concerns one of my constituents came to me with, is that they keep changing the rules. So they meet the requirement, and then they up the ante. And now she can't, this one individual, uh, had to close her facility. So, you know, she, or she had it in her home. It's a moving target. So. Well, we appreciate, I mean, your concern is that if we were to move to public pre-K, it would negatively impact what you're offering right now and could, of course, uh, unintentionally force your closure. And it sounds like for learning environment, having those four and five-year-olds is also very key to you know, model behavior, uh, all that kind of thing. Correct. I mean, last year I had um, an opening and I already had my infant slots filled. Like I said, I can only have two kids under the age of two and all I was getting for phone calls were four month olds. Mm. So I had an opening for several months that I could not fill because of that. So if we're taking out a whole nother age group, you know, that does make it that much harder for us to fill those slots. And, you know, financially we need our six slots filled. Yep. Okay. Ms. Otis, we recognize you probably have kids waking up right now, so we will go to, uh, I think, Allison, you are next, if that, but feel free to stay on, Stacey, if you'd like. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Great. Allison. 
Hi, I did just want to make one note that you you had mentioned in your discussion there. Uh, well, maybe we maybe the public school systems can partner with these private programs. That is what is happening right now. The public school systems don't have the capacity to serve all four and five year three four and five year olds, and so they're partnering with programs. We become qualified through the Agency of Education to be a pre K partner, and we are serving those three and four and five year olds in our programs. So I just wanted to make that clarifying point. And now I'll get into my testimony, which I did send over to Hayden. So hopefully he has shared that with all of you. Thank you for this opportunity to share my story with you today. My name is Allison Grisb. I have worked in the field of early childhood education for over 25 years. I have a master's degree in early childhood education, and I hold a Vermont level two teaching license, ages birth through six. I am currently the director of the Bennington Early Childhood Center in Bennington. We are a pre-qualified pre-K partner site through the Agency of Education, and we are a five stars quality early childhood education program through the Child Development Di Division of the Agency of Human Services. We partner with both the Southwest Vermont Supervisory Union and the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. We serve 70 children in our community. And this year, um, 39 of those 70 students are receiving universal pre-K funds. 24 of, 23 of those students are four-year-olds and 16 are three-year-olds. We have been partnering with public school systems since 2008. Our program is open 7.30 to five o'clock each day with options to attend as few as three mornings per week or as much as five full days per week. <clears throat> Our program does run on a school year schedule so we're open uh, September through June, closed for school vacation weeks, just like the school system. But we offer camps on those vacation weeks and camps throughout the summer. So families who do need year-round care are able to get it. Our high-quality program is sought after by many families in our area, including those that work at Bennington College, and Southwest Vermont Medical Center. Our program is child and family centered, offering a variety of hands-on learning experiences and the introduction of the scientific method to encourage our students to become independent thinkers and instill a lo lifelong love of learning. Currently, our pre-K students are learning about the properties of matter. They're writing their own stories and mastering 300-piece jigsaw puzzles, just to name a few things. They're going home and sharing their knowledge with family members and are excited <coughs> and eager to come to school every day. Today, I'm here to talk to you about how Universal Pre-K has impacted our program as a business and as well as how it benefits our families. Universal Pre-K funds help to keep our program afloat financially. This financial benefit comes around in, in two different ways. First, the state's rate per hour for pre-K is higher than what we charge for our other hours during the day. <clears throat> and so subsequently, we're able to pay our teachers a little bit more because we have more money coming in, although it's still not enough. Um, and secondly, families who start at our program as one-year-olds or two-year-olds often come for just three mornings or three days. And then when they hit that three-year-old mark and they start getting um, funding from universal pre-K for those 10 hours, they up the ante because they're used to paying whatever it is, a couple hundred dollars a week. Now that time is being covered by the state. And so they pay for an, or they add on a couple hours or a couple days per week and continue paying the same amount that they were paying. So that helps our enrollment. Sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, and being a pre-K partner site is not only financially advantageous for us, 
but it also provides us with a network of other pre-K partner programs to share ideas with, um, and it offers us professional development opportunities through the supervisory unions that often are of greater quality and certainly of greater cost than we would be able to provide our staff ourselves. Over these past 15 years of being a pre-K partner, we have built strong relationships with our local supervisory unions. We work closely with them to provide special education services to our students, and we work with them to help make the transition to kindergarten as smooth as possible. So in our state's current mixed delivery system of universal pre-K, parents have options to best meet the needs of their family. Some families need year-round care. Some families need full day care. Some families don't need care, but they want their children to um, get the social and academic benefits of a high quality pre-K program. High quality programs can be found in a variety of settings. They can be found in elementary schools. They can be found in private licensed programs like mine and Linda's. They can be found in family child care home programs like Stacy's. I do believe some changes should be made to the current universal pre-K program, such as increasing the hours of the current system beyond 10 hours per week and greater consistency between the private partner programs and the public school programs as far as hours offered or um, number of hours children are served but I do not believe that three-year-olds should be removed from the universal pre-K system. And I do not believe that families' options should be limited to just public schools. We need to do what is best for the children in our state and supporting high quality programs that are getting the job done successfully and supporting families to make the best choices for their personal situations would do just that. Some might say that if four-year-olds moved out of private early childhood education programs, then there would be more room for infants and toddlers, which is very much needed. But the situation isn't as simple as that. Would there be more physical space in our programs? Yes, but that space would not necessarily be appropriate for infants and toddlers. The ratio of children to staff for infants is capped at four to one and for toddlers at five to one, whereas the ratio for preschool students is capped at 10 to one, which means infants and toddlers need more staff per group of children. Our current regulations also limit the number of infants in one room to eight, toddlers to 10, and preschoolers to 20. So if we try to turn spaces that once held 15 to 20 preschoolers into infants or infant or toddler rooms, then we would either have to put large amounts of money into reconstructing our rooms so that the center can still accept as many students as it did before, or run our programs with fewer students. Both options would be financially damaging to programs. I know part of the intent of S56 is to increase childcare capacity and support the financial viability of childcare programs. However, I fear that this proposed change to the universal pre-K program would have the opposite effect. As you are working through this long awaited, much needed childcare bill, I urge you to consider how changes to the current system could adversely affect both families' abilities to meet their needs and programs' abilities to effectively operate. It is not an easy task to overhaul our current child care system in a way that will make early childhood education both affordable and accessible to all families and to fairly compensate and support early childhood educators. I hope that listening to stories like ours today will help you to make informed decisions. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for joining us. Any immediate questions for Ms. Chris? Okay, I think it's consistent with what we've heard. Uh, Ms. January, I don't, you, you have sent uh, extensive and it looks incredibly thoughtful, and I say this in every positive way, testimony. 
Um, we don't have time to go through for you to read it. Uh, if you could give us the highlights, that would be helpful, and then leave it to us to review it. Um, usually, we think of witnesses about five minutes or so, five to seven minutes each. Uh, does that work for you? Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, that's that works. Okay, but first, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, and where's your where's uh, Otter Creek Child Care Center? Yeah, for the record, um, I'm Linda January, the executive director of Otter Creek Child Center in Middlebury, Vermont. We are a um, we serve children birth through preschool, um, and we are also a universal uh, pre-qualified um, pre-K partner. Um, so <laughs> as you can tell by what I submitted, it was hard to kind of um, narrow it down. There's a lot in here. Um, and I think for me, I will, um, I think an point, important point is that as an early childhood educator provider, who's also pre-qualified UPK partner, it's very difficult to silo out UPK from the full system. U, uh, UPK is one layer of multi-revenue sources that make Otter Creek's budget work. And for families, UPK is often one layer of many that can include discount scholarships, the child care financial assistance program that make their monthly bu budgets work. For better or worse, um, UPK, as it stands today, is an integrated vital part of many early care and education programs, and it's one piece of the funding puzzle that makes early care and education programs affordable to families. Um, my concerns with the changes laid out in S56 with pre-K are kind of summarized in five different themes that have um, emerged for me as I've been reading and watching and listening to all things S56 related. It's becoming all consuming these last few weeks. Um, so I'll just touch on those five themes. Um, and Allison and Stacy also touched on them briefly. So the first is that the UPK system is complex and no one likes it. And <laughs> it is complex it's it's complex on both ends of it as a pro private provider currently we partner with four districts um, which means there's four contracts four attendant systems four invoices systems four payment schedules um, and in addison county school districts are partnering with over 30 pre-qualified programs it is a lot of paperwork but the important thing to know is that um, we're making it work. Um, on the ground, private and public programs have created effective systems that are working. Um, and we've been doing this since it, um, since Act 166 was passed in 2014. And actually many of us have been doing it long before um, the current system was in place. Uh, the second theme I'm hearing is this idea that private programs don't like the AOE involved and public programs don't like human services, the agency of human services being involved. Um, and I agree that that dual oversight of the system makes it complex um, and that there are complaints on both sides. But what I will say is when you drill down to the local partnership level, it is working. Relationships are being built between private and public programs, and we are meeting the needs of families and children. Um, where it's not working and where frustration lies with the field is at the highest level of management directly between the agency of education and the agency of human services. As a pre-qualified uh, UPK program, my biggest frustration comes when, um, when communication to the field isn't direct, when questions go unanswered, and when new mandates are created without adequate resources or supports for programs to meet those mandates. It's not with 
my local partnership with my local supervisory union. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another theme is these changes will alleviate the dual oversight and simplify the system. Um, this is, there was a system analysis that I hope you all are aware of that was completed um, in the summer of 2022. And that system analysis um, recommendation was to create a new unit of state government that is focused entirely on early childhood with a single empowered leader with oversight of a core cluster of key early childhood programs. This proposal goes directly against that recommendation. Um, and as a private program, it doesn't get rid of that dual oversight. As a program, you would still be caring for three-year-olds and three-year-olds who would be receiving um, early essential education. Um, we would still be required to meet law, education laws, rules, and mandates by serving those children. Um, so it just silos the system further without actually making it less complicated. Um, Allison touched on this next one, is that if, you know, if four-year-olds leave the private sector, it will fix the capacity issues for infants and toddlers. And I will just say it again, as clearly as possible, a preschool space does not equal an infant toddler space in any way that you examine it. it they are not the same. Um, and the last theme is around this idea that um, families can still choose to access a, the private sector for their four-year-olds. And in theory, yes, there will be space for families to still access the private sectors. Um, but my fear is that with the changes to UPK, along with um, changes to CCFAP, that families above 450% of the federal poverty level will be priced out of the system. When I examine the potentials of what the new system would be, um, I found that families between 500 and 800% of the federal poverty level um, could possibly pay between 24% and 39% of their income towards full-time year-round care. And that's for an infant and a four-year-old. Um, that's a potentially a $4,400 monthly payment. There's no family currently at Otter Creek who could afford that. And, that's, and that would affect 40% of our current population um, that could potentially be priced out. Um, and so there is a lovely quote here from a family at Otter Creek. There's also, um, I'm the co-leader of the Addison County Directors Network. And in that network, you know, we've been talking a lot about S56 and concerns. There's real concerns for small programs that are, are um, UPK, um, pre-qualified programs that are school year, um, just serving preschool children, huge concerns for their viability if these changes take effect. Um, as um, I quoted here, Sue White, who's the teaching director of Corey Hill, she said that for Corey Hill, um, they are not equipped or qualified or really interested in providing quality care and programming for younger children. So they would have to make huge um, decisions about their programming. Ashley Bassett, the director of Evergreen Preschool in Virgins, her first response to me after reading um, S56 was, I think I'm out of a job. Um, and if those smaller programs close, then there will be a larger capacity issue for three-year-olds um, in Addison County. At the end, I, I have a list of pondering questions that I hope you go through and think about. And then I just really um, hope that 
at the very least you think about um, these things. Consider in studying the full financial impact that public schools were shorter by converting classroom space into age appropriate space for pre-kindergarten age children. Um, an appropriate classroom space for a sixth grader does not equal an appropriate, appropriate space for a pre-K student. Um, just as you consider the financial impact on the public sector, do the same for the private sector. How many programs were closed? What are the added expenses that programs will face in order to shift to serve younger children? Is there enough of a population of three-year-olds to sustain the system? Study the impacts the changes will have on the workforce. How many more licensed teachers will the public sector need? What are the qualification para educators will need to meet NACI accreditation standards? Are there enough early childhood professionals to meet the demand? Study the impacts on the workforce. And then talk with families and examine the financial impacts that the and the logistical complication these changes will create for four-year-olds. And one of the things that I keep thinking about is from um, testimony that was given last Friday in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee from Elliot Haspel. When he was speaking about the vision of Vermont that Vermont has for the early childhood system, he said, to accomplish Vermont's laudable vision, it is critical to expand subsidy eligibility to be universal or near universal and to have a mixed delivery preschool system. The absence of these policy elements will not so much have unintended negative consequences as have predictable negative consequences that hurt the very people you're trying to help. I cannot stop thinking about this quote and the predictable negative consequences S56 will have on the early childhood system. And I implore you to continue to think about what those possible negative consequences are. And as you move forward to make changes to S56 and realize that you can move forward on things like CCFAP, as well as supports for early childhood professional, professionals, supports for non-citizen children and tax relief for providers, while at the same time slowing down on changes to UBK or deciding to separate UPK from S56 and create a separate bill that will allow you to take a deeper dive into all the possible predictable negative consequences changes to UPK could have on our early childhood system. Ms. January, I think uh, we're going to have to take some questions now. No, you know, I, I appreciate your passion. I appreciate everything you're saying. I think one of the things that you mentioned that I hadn't thought about was if if all of a sudden some of these some of this this policy change were to force some closures that we would be opening up some real problems for finding spots for the youngest Vermonters among us the the, the birth to three year olds. Um, and I guess that's just something I, I hadn't really thought much about. Um, and I don't know if that's come up in your committee in the morning, uh, but not as clear not as, 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 as this. this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, please. So, uh, so I, I just wanted to thank Allison and, and Linda um, for their testimony. It's a really uh, quite compelling. Uh, so, what what I as I kind of try to get my head around this, I'm looking at the. Um, the stated problem of essentially 9,000, there's a gap of 9,000 seats uh, for uh, uh, early childcare. Uh, not necessarily four-year-olds, uh, but somewhere in that order. And I'm just curious, you, you both seem to be successful in your pursuits. I'm wondering what's inhibiting you from either expanding your current business or creating satellites to mirror what you're doing, but do it in you know a different village or a different part of the city or what have you. Just wonder if you can comment on that for a sec. Allison, do you want to take a stab at that first? Sure. It's a, the the there's there are a lot of factors at play. Uh, one, I think I think I oh. would um, 
I would die if I had to run two different programs because it's hard enough uh, to run one program. But I, I do uh, understand what you're saying. And I do know that there are some people that are successful at doing that. I just don't know if I personally could do it. Um, as far as expanding, I would love to expand my pro program. Uh, but we are at our max capacity for our wastewater permit. We have a septic system. We do not have sewers accessible to us. And so we cannot expand to any more children than what we um, currently serve. Linda? Um, so funny question because <laughs> For the past, I don't know, seven years, um, I have been working on a huge expansion project for Otter Creek in partnership with Middlebury College. And we are very hopeful to break ground this calendar year. Um, but it has taken so long because it's a massive undertaking. We would, if our plans go as are now, we will increase um capacity by 77 daily slots um and those are infants through preschool um slots um it's a 10 million dollar project we are adding you know to do that and to do it well we're adding 12 i think it's over 12,000 square feet to our existing building we will go from um four classrooms to possibly 13 classrooms um it's a huge undertaking and it has taken literally a village to make it happen um we have you know we we have some funding coming that we're excited about and we'll be applying for other um grant opportunities but the amount of capital required to expand and to create truly developmentally appropriate space um, is just, yeah. And in like wastewater, right? You run into, we are in sewer. I don't have to deal with wastewater, but I have to do an environmental review that's costing us $40,000. That, that has historical preservation and archaeologists and, and mm. you know, we have to study bats and like all this other stuff. So it's, it's really difficult. And if I didn't have the partnership with Middlebury College, it would not be possible. This has been incredibly helpful to us as we just jump in today to the pre-K question. And I think you've helped us all to understand some of the impacts that if we were to move to a public pre-K system, you know, some of the things that I think some, some of us may not have been considering, I'm just speaking for myself. Uh, so thank you both. Uh, we are just in the beginnings uh, of this, and I don't know if you heard me say it when we first started. This is the piece of the bill, the pre-K, the part that would end up in our public schools that this committee has jurisdiction over. So I suspect you'll be back over or be invited to health and welfare where, where the rest of the bill is. And uh, whether it's good or bad at this point, half that committee is on this committee. Um, <laughs> and so there's some, some overlap. Uh, so thank you both for joining us. Very much appreciated. And uh, please stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kimmy, first impressions before we take a five-minute break. Uh, in terms of, let me put it this way: I'm going to be asked to uh, report back sometime sooner rather than later whether or not this committee wants to move to universal pre-K in the public schools, and in some ways possibly it can be defined or I think remove it from the other providers or do people want to generally keep it here? I mean, no big decision right now, but I'm just wondering any sort of first impressions. I, I don't think we know what we don't know. How, yeah. how many people, how many pre-K is it going to affect? Yeah, yeah. So do, does anybody have a handle on Somebody must know how many um, daycares and pre-K there are in the state, yeah, yeah. and how, how much is going, how is it going to affect them? 
And can we, do we have the capacity in the school districts to, to take it on? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I can't remember if it was covered already, but you know, my, my first question goes to the amount of demand that there is for childcare. And you know, if it is made, if it does go to the public, or if it does become universal pre-K in the schools, is there really that low of a population that there won't be new kids to go to these other, to, uh, to these private locations that are concerned? Yeah. And I, I feel like they, they did mention something along the lines, or they, I feel like maybe they did mention that, but um, maybe I just missed it. Uh, so I'll probably have to just rewatch the thing. But I mean, that's just that was one of my first thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Yeah, Sir Dulick. Uh, what do you think about the idea of moving forward with pre-K uh, and taking it away from the centers? Is really the question on the table. Oh, um, I mean that's or just kind of generally going around first yeah, impressions right, based on this. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I live in Burlington, and I I know that Sarah can can agree with me on this. It works well in Burlington, our mixed delivery system. I think we have a good. Um, a good relationship between the schools and the private providers. Um, but we've also been increasing our capacity in our schools for pre-K, which is, has been really nice because we had some room in Sustainability Academy, I think, in the Integrated Arts Academy. So, and then in also Flynn School, which is the school out in my way out um, in the North End. So we've been able to grow those, which has been great. Um, I love the idea of having um, pre-K delivered by um, teachers who are certified and who reap the benefits of working in a public school, which is, you know, healthcare and um, sometimes they're some of the best paid folks in the community, depending on where you are in the state. So for me, those are pluses. Um, yeah, I mean, I still, I there's still, I still have questions about the bill that I have not been answered, including the oversight piece. So I want that to be fleshed out a little bit more. Um, so I mean, I'm, I, I'm gonna solve this problem, and if, if this helps solve the problem, then I'm, I'm all for it. But I'm just, again, I'm still learning. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so am I. I was again, I'll say, and I think this is somewhat similar to what Senator Hashim said is. If we do cut, if we do say to these folks, you're not going to get public funding for four or five year olds, is the unintended consequence they close because they cannot keep going financially, and then that does make a bigger problem with the infant to three and a half year old or whatever. Right. That's I mean, what's kind of interesting. Yeah. That's, and I would just say, if we were to go to the system, we would need to look at how could we address that problem. Is there something we could do? either combine some centers, or I don't know. I don't have, don't have the answer, yeah. but how would yeah. we address that? Because that is a big concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm concerned that you know we don't know the demographics. Like in my school district, yeah. the population is increasing. Yeah. So is there capacity for to have both, maybe? Uh -huh. So because we don't really know if, we, if the economy starts to come back, we start to get more people, they're going to have to have more, um, more programs. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I've seen a little bit of an uptick. I'm just thinking of one school in particular that started a pre-K program recently. Um, yeah, at the local elementary school, and I think that was, I'm guessing, school board decision. And okay, there no, are, this is helpful. There, sorry yeah. to interrupt. There are some districts like South Burlington that their elementary schools are bursting at the seams, as far as I know. That's what I've heard. Do they so have pre-K now? No. no. Don't think so. So they would have to be hard for them to pass this. It's good to be in a growth area. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's a good problem to have. South it's been in okay. Burlington. I know in Palmy we have uh, <laughs> elementary school has a pre-K. Pre -K and they've got a uh, private full-time in a private part. Okay. So and they all seem to get along and work together. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can of course only speak to you know Allison's incredible right. and she's got a great program. It seems like it's you know 
been around for a while and seems to have good relationships. And I think everybody probably does in their district also. All right, let's take five minutes and we'll come back to, uh, sorry, Under Secretary Boucher, we're running a little behind. Dr. Boucher, it's great to see you. Likewise. And it's great to see Vermont Digger behind you. Welcome back to Senate Education Tuesday, Valentine's Day, 251. Education quality standards. Uh, according to my notes, uh, Senator Hewitt raised a concern, and I think it's one that we all have, around uh, educational quality standards as it relates to our independent schools in particular. And we have St. John's Berry Academy coming back in uh, to answer some of Senator Phillips' questions. But before we do that, before they do come in, I thought we might just take a moment and just understand educational sure. quality standards in general in the state. Uh, one of the things that some people may say we do too much of or not enough of, this committee, and I think it's true of health and welfare and natural resources also, there's so much policy and there's so much that has to be taken in. Institutions, GovOps, I mean, let's be honest. What do they really do? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You missed it. I'm uh, no, I was kidding. I was just talking about institutions and co-ops. So you're going to get me in trouble. No, no, no. But uh, this is, it, it, this is heavy policy. So anything you can help us sure. with with E2S would be great. Sure. Happy to be back here. Uh, for the record, Dr. Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary for Education here. Um, by the way, I'm not sure I said this. I'm in my eighth year as the Deputy Secretary. Congratulations. So, um, congratulations, wow. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> um, I, I love it. It's good yeah. work. Um, I think we have a fantastic education system. I'm not sure I actually had a chance to kind of tell you that. And, um, you know, I've, I've been working in this area for quite some time now. So um, I thankfully um, thought that um, kind of an overview of the education quality standards might be what you were looking for. Um, I know that you had Amanda Garces and Diego who are on the Act One. Um, Amanda is the. Yes. Um, Chair of the Act One Working Group, and um, I actually had prepared this presentation, an earlier version of this, for that group to kind of walk through what exactly are education standards, um, where do they come from, what do they mean, who do they pertain to, all those questions. Um, and I think that you will see a couple of slides that are probably familiar to you given that last, um, last uh, week's testimony. I am actually a member of the Act One Working Group, too, so, so that. Um, uh, creates a, a nice, I think, interface for us to make sure we're doing things kind of according to the, on that work group, according to the, the uh, process that's yeah. set in, forth. In your introduction, if you could just see how they mesh. Are they one and the same? We talk about, you know, Act 1 and EQS. How do they, when, where do they come together? Sure. So um, they're not the same. So Act 1 was a particular um, law um, that was passed, I believe, Four years ago. session four, okay, yeah. so it's four been a while, ago. four years ago, yeah. um, that um, did a variety of things, but the primary piece was to um, form um, a working group um, with a, um, a set body of different entities, stakeholders um, around the state um, who could all inform the conversation about uh, what we call um, um, ethnic studies. Um, also related to things like social justice. Um, really what this was about was how do we ensure that our education system is meeting the needs fully for all of our students, in particular students who come from what we might term um, historically marginalized yeah. backgrounds. We, we just, we actually met yesterday and we had a really rich discussion about like what are these terms that we use? And so I'm kind of like thinking, what are we, we didn't come up with anything that we wanna use because we're still having that conversation, but at the time, we would say historically marginalized, mm -hmm. sometimes you're students of color, uh, BIPOC mm -hmm. um, um, populations. And so um, for many folks, just as an aside, those don't really seem to um, resonate with them individually. And that's kind of what we were having that conversation about last night. But I, I said that was an aside. So Act One really was about how do we actually, and it was framed around a, um, a couple of studies in Vermont and then some national work that had shown um, the education sphere is one where we really need to make sure that all students feel welcome, feel safe, feel that they see themselves in the instruction and the curriculum that um, they're taught every day. 
So in a nutshell, that's what Act One is, and I'm doing it, I'm sure, quite short shrift. <laughs> So um, EQS is um, what the State Board of Education, and I'll talk about this in just a sec, what the State Board of Education um, developed. The first version of it was back in the early 1980s, I believe 84, 85. And it was in response to um, Title 16, like a real core aspect of Title 16, which actually said the State Board is responsible for the quality of education. And so, they um, went through a process where they actually came up with rules, which is what the EQS are, their 2200 rule series, that actually spelled out um, at that time, you know, here's what um, the State Board of Education for Vermont is requiring in terms of our education quality for the whole system. And then over time, um, the last version of the EQS was, um, that, so over time with, with rules, and this is the part where I'm not sure you've actually had some of that introduction to like literally as basic as like here's how laws are made and what happens to them afterwards. I can go into that a little bit. Um, And that's on some of the slides I have. But so um, rules, um, you know, like law, like occasionally need to be or regularly need to be um, updated. And so that's what happens with, that is, is what's happened with the EQS as well. The last time they were updated was 2015. How they interface, which is a great question, is that, um, and I can talk about this a little bit um, in the presentation, the um, Act One, part of what was required of the Act One working group was to look at the education standards and then also to look at, um, to the extent feasible, to look at practices um, in um, local school districts, um, local policies, those kinds of things. So, um, and this is, uh, the Act One working group is um, a great, uh, collective, collaborative of a lot of folks um, from the community, and so they are not um, as steeped even as any of us in kind of like this kind of stuff. Like a lot of the work that we all do is, of course, very. It's not. Um, it's not plain English. <laughs> so they needed. You know, most people would. Um, you know, my entire family would not understand what the heck I do if they actually looked at what what I write um, every day. So we spent a lot of time actually um, making sure that all members of Act One understood this process, and that's where this um, this uh, presentation um, initially started from. So um, because of that, the working group, the Act One working group, started with the state education standards because again, that is sort of the marching orders for all of our LEAs from the state, from the State Board of Education, that says, here's what thou shalt do in terms of um, provisioning quality for education. So it made sense for the working group to say, all right, let's start there. We want to make sure that um, we have a lens that is really framed around equity and framed around um, making sure all students are um, you know, covered, addressed, taken care of um, in these education standards. So that's kind of a broader background. I thought I might jump into, um, it's not a very long presentation, so I thought I might just jump in um, and just kind of walk through some of those pieces, if that's okay. Sure. And you're talking about this presentation? Yes, yes. I also provided a link, I think Maureen sent separately, a link to the actual education quality standards. Yes, I think there's a thing that was. Yeah. And so you can actually see, um, you know, uh, from a more concrete perspective, um, what actually is in them. And then, um, at the end, I'll talk about where we currently are with the EQS because right now they're actually they're not open officially, which is a real which is a thing, and I'll talk about what that means. But there um, there's work happening on them because of um, Act One. So um, the second slide there is really a little bit of um, just a, a high order of like how is state education policy developed, and you know I can't really speak to other. Um, Spheres, um, it might be different. Um, all I can speak to is education, but in typical, it, but it, it's ideally this is what happens. So, and this list goes from more um, general to more specific as you go down these bullets. So, the General Assembly passes a statute, passes a law. Um, then, the State Board of Education typically is asked to enact rules um, based on that statute. Sometimes not if the law is so crystal clear that you don't need rules to go along with it, but more often than not, um, particularly in education, um, it's complex. And so there are often a need for rules to actually really spell out how that would look. Yes. So one of the things that I, and I don't think anyone knows that we've asked 
is how did we get proficiency learning? Ledge Council says it's not in a bill. It's not in so the bill. We're, so what I'm wondering, and, and I did invite Secretary, former Secretary Colcom in. Mm -hmm. She said, and I understand, uh, she thinks perhaps Jess DeCarolis might be better when Jess is back. Yep. But it's, we've heard from teachers and parents that have some concerns about mm -hmm. it. Where did it come from? Who so directed whom? Who? The State Board of Education directed proficiency-based graduation requirements, which was their purview, in rule. Okay. Mm -hmm. They didn't do anything wrong. They, okay. They, you know, I was. We're yep. just trying to get to the, sure. the meat of where did it yep. where did it come from? Because it's a big impact. You know, it's had a big impact. Whether people want to yeah. say positive or negative, I, I, I don't know. But those kinds of things yeah. happen, and it's important for us to yeah. understand how they sort of get out there. And that's kind of what I said, ideally, this yeah. is the way the process works. Yeah. But um, in the context of how the law is written, Title 16, the yeah. State Board of Ed does have its own um, authority and also probably at the time, like right, like its own um, mandate, you know, given what was happening um, in the state contextually, there was a lot of work going on with proficiency-based learning. It was tied very closely with flexible pathways. We yeah. can talk about that. So um, Dr. that Jay, became, would it take the Secretary of Education to say, we want to, I want you all to look at this at proficiency-based learning and move forward? Or is it, if they can just- At that time. At that time. At that time, and this is also another layer of complexity. So at that time, the State Board of Education would tell the, the commissioner at that time what to do because the commissioner of education was actually employed by the State Board of Education. The flexible pathways were done in the Secretary Holcomb. The, but this work started during that okay. transition to her. So at the so at the same time she came in and yes. we became a secretary. She, the yes. role became a secretary and was yeah. part of the administration. And I will say that happened, but it's still taken us some time, and we're still not even I think a hundred percent there of actually cleaning up all of the legislation that yeah. we keep finding little tiny things every now and then where it's like oh we're no longer a department of education. So there was a, a period of time where it was a bit of a gray area Absolutely. in terms of like, who was on first. So um, I know that um, my predecessor, John Fisher, if that rings a bell, yes. was who yes. was really um, you know, a strong leader in terms of proficiency-based learning and flexible pathways. Um, so I think it was both coming from, at that time, the Department of Education yeah. and also the State Board of Ed. But the it's state just, board yeah, of ed, that's helpful. okay, they decided like we're going to go with proficiency-based graduation yeah. requirements, and so then our obligation was okay. That's in rule, meaning our obligation of at that critical moment when it was probably passed. I can't remember department slash agency, and then to be the agency because we were in that transition. Yeah. It's, it was still our role to then translate that for the field, and so a lot of the work that Jess has done is all of that translation. Which is under the state education of uh, the state agency of education. The third bullet is the developing of guidance and the yeah. technical assistance and the best practice examples and professional development and learning. All of that stuff. So could this still happen under the new structure? The state board of education says we're going to move in a certain direction, whether voters or there's no legislative process. Can that still? Well, right now we're in another kind of interesting space, mm -hmm. and so. Um, Part of the interesting thing about our agency is that the rest of the agencies all have, to my knowledge, the rest of the agencies in our Vermont government system have their own rulemaking authority as an agency. We never had that. So that was one of those funny things that was still under this Board of Education. And this is where the district quality standards piece came in. So that is the agency of education's first foray into now as an agency, we're doing rulemaking. So we will run the whole process of rulemaking, which is a process. You have to take lots of stakeholder feedback. You have to actually get approval through two um, ICAR and LCAR um, committees that are, that are um, yep. I think, um, within the bowels of um, the governmental system. And I think also um, they might have edu uh, they might have, yeah. 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 I was going to say, they have legislators on that as well. We have all those. We know well. those well. Yeah. 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 So, um, so, so right now, um, we're still working um, under EQS that are yeah. owned by um, 
the um, State Board of Education. Okay. And you'll see when we start, when we, I think we're going to come and give an update on the DQS, which yeah. are district quality standards, and you'll see sort of how both of us, the State Board of Ed and Agency of Ed, we've worked together, have been, have thought of that conceptually. Because I don't think anyone is interested in um, a heavy divorce between these two. That doesn't, that's not good for our education system in general. We want to be working together always. Okay, good. No, I, Joey Donovan represent from with. I mean, I was against any kind of divorce, and then when they Shumlin and Donovan and others said, "No, we've got to move to the secretary," I was like, "No, no, no!" And now I, I get it, and I, I, I like moving more. Yeah. My instincts are to move more in that direction. I think that's a little bit of a different divorce. That was like yeah, first yeah. divorce yeah, phase one, right, and right, right. Um, I'm talking about the if we are going to have a state board of ed, which yeah. I think we we are committed to at this point. And it's important that yeah. the Agency of Education continue working very closely with that State Board of Ed. Thank you. Um, does that help? Yes. It's, vi it's all murky. It's yeah. very murky. So I hope that I'm providing some clarity for this. Um, and then the LEAs, um, I've used that lingo. You've probably heard it. So that's the local education agencies. For us, that basically means the districts. Um, technically, supervisory units are districts because we're interesting in Vermont, but basically it's districts. And they develop then, as a result of all of the guidance and the technical assistance, they develop their own policies that are in line with the law, the rule, and the technical assistance, ideally, that they've received. The state agency of education um, stuff is typically not mandatory. So it's more guidance and technical assistance. You saw, though, um, I, mean, I could just wax poetic on this, so stop me off. But So you saw, though, when we had the COVID state of emergency, I don't know if you'll remember this. The um, because the governor declared a state of emergency, it allowed the secretary at that time to actually have the word of law, not law, but the word of rule that said, you know, this is what we're going to do. It's mandated. So without that state of emergency, that's that's not um, what um, the agency has the authority to do. And this comes up quite a lot because. Um, you know, we're often in a spot where folks get frustrated, rightfully so, um, with um, the, the agency and they're, oh, why can't you do this? Why can't you, you know, why can't you fix this? And, and often we say we understand um, that would need a new law or that would need new rule because we, you know, I'll, I could think of an example of some other time to share about that. But so it's kind of heady stuff, but I think it's important to kind of just keep in mind there's a lot of different um, players. There's a lot of different roles and responsibilities for folks. Um, and then I just give you an example of that um, back to, oh gosh, why did I use this as the example, right? Pre K. <laughs> this was Act 166. Um, there's a lot going on in, in pre K, as we know. Um, on, I'm on now on slide four. And I was trying to use this to explain that the Act One work, and this really gets at your question, uh, Mr. Chair, the Act One work was really about um, the working group actually carrying out their charge that was um, in Act One and starting by looking at um, the State Board of Education rules. And there are many different rules. EQS is one set of rules. I will say right off the bat, um, the current instantiation of EQS um, does not pertain to independent schools. It pertains only to public schools. It doesn't pertain to approved independent schools. It, it only pertains to public schools. And so um, part of uh, what the recommendations were from the Act 1 working group, um, and I'll, I'll move into that now. So. The well, well, before that, can yeah. you just give us an example then <clears throat> of something that uh, the public would be required to do under EQS that the independents would j just uh, uh, class size. Class size. So, okay. so that we have um, in in some of the EQS there are there's a a little sort of um, not really a formula, but it has, and I don't have it memorized, but it has um, you know the student teacher ratio that okay. um, is. Um, uh, I don't even know if it's required, but it's strongly suggested in that rule. Um, there are um, similar ratios for um, student counselor to teacher, or student counselor, excuse me, to student um, ratios, those kinds of things. So um, the whole, <laughs> 
another complexity, the whole aspect of licensure. Right. Uh, but that's actually not the State Board of Education, just to clarify and, and confuse things even more. That's actually the Standards Board. Sure, sure. Separate entity. So there are a variety of that's things like that. that, that helps that, me understand yeah, what's sort of in that. Yeah. All of this. So for instance, um, no independent school will be required to set up a multi-tiered system of support, which is really cr critical to Act 173, which you might heard of. Um, so. Since um, 2015, um, that instantiation of the EQS really was heavy on MTSS. Um, and so that's when that was required. And we then we built up a team in the agency. Um, we have an MTSS team. They've done a lot of work. And they really help local, um, both districts and schools, build up that system. Is that helpful? Yeah, and just to refresh my memory, uh, uh, S-173, Act 173, we passed largely having to do with special education. Correct. Correct. Okay. We did hear from the fellow from St. John's Barry on this a little bit last yeah. week. I just yeah. keep, want to keep all my acts yeah. in and, order. You know, and that's, I think, an interesting thing, too. So um, another piece, and this is actually uh, bleeding more into federal regulation, but our independent schools are not obligated to partake in our um, state assessments. Mm -hmm. Um, however, um, our four um, academies, um, historically public um, high schools, so that would be uh, St. J, which you heard testimony on, um, LI, um, the Linden Institute, Fatford Academy, and Burn Burton Academy have always decided that they actually want to do yes. assessments right. um, like the public's. And so that's another funny and interesting practical layer that a lot of the, I, I don't know, I shouldn't say a lot, some of the independent schools actually want to do um, what's in the EQS. They might feel differently if it was mandated. Sure. Um, okay, thank you. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are a, different, a bunch of different, um, and maybe it might make, make sense to actually look at the EQS and just walk through, because I think that'll give you a flavor of like what is in them. Um, and then also, I'm not gonna steal my boss's thunder, but I could give you a little prelude about why the DQS are, are coming and might be necessary. Um, Great, so we have, so you wanna shift to this stuff? Yeah. Okay. I kind of mapped out sort of the high level in that um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, the first section is the statutory authority. As I, this is for the 2000 series. So as I said, it, it really um, stems from right up front in 16 VSA, um, 164 and 165. Um, it really kind of jumps into um, the core of our education system. So you can see um, some um, kind of required non-discrimination um, language um, up front. And I wanted to bring this to, then there's a whole section on definitions. And by the way, um, this document is what is currently sitting, a revised version of this, is currently sitting with a subcommittee of the State Board of Ed. And I'm not gonna speak to that because that would not be my purview, but that might be a really great thing for you if you would like to hear testimony from the co-chairs of that subcommittee, Tammy Colbay and Kim Gleason, because they are now taking the recommendations from the Athlon Working Group and working them through and, and taking a lot of their own testimony on like what makes sense um, to do. And we have provided some technical corrections to them on some of that. Um, but in general, you know, we're in agreement with a lot of what, I mean, I was working on it myself, so, you know, there's been a lot of crosstalk between our um, entities, the Act 1 Working Group and, and the agency. So, I'm showing you what's currently on the books. These are actually going to change in the next year um, based on what the Act 1 Working Group has put in place. I don't necessarily think, and again, I, I, I want to be careful because they're not, I don't, we don't own them. The Agency of Education is own them. I don't know necessarily if the structure is going to change, right? You're going to probably have the same structures with some additions. But um, you, you will see that it will have a lot more focus on um, those pieces that I talked about with ensuring that all students um, from diverse, uh, varied backgrounds are um, feeling um, at home in the curriculum and instructional practice. Um, in a lot of this. So um, 
I think the first section, and I'm just going to do high level, is what we might anticipate, which is curriculum and instruction. So the, this is a 2120, <laughs> and it is on page four of um, the EPS <laughs> document. Um, so here's where you start to see, and it's not proficiency-based learning, but it does get personalization comes in. Instructional practices shall promote personalization. This is where they first came in, to my knowledge, um, in this 2015 version of the EQS. So personalization and this notion that um, really students should be driving their learning, they should really be engaged, and part of that is to actually personalize to the extent we can the lessons that they're um, they are exposed to and sort of like allowing them to kind of um, craft and create their own um, unique types of ways of showing proficiency and of also incorporating material that really speaks to them into things like projects and into papers and those kinds of things. This is one example. You start to see that kind of come in here with the personalization. Flexible Pathways actually is a direct link to statute because at the same time Act 77 was passed by y'all, which is <laughs> which is Act 77 of, I believe, 2013. Mm -hmm. And so this follows that um, process that I was talking about. So Act 77 was passed, then here, under curriculum and instruction, is a whole section t teeing up, we've got these things called flexible pathways now, and we're speaking to them. And it lists them out just as um, Act 77 does. Um, Career and technical education comes next. Um, just as one example of how this process is iterative, um, we recommended um, that Act 77 in the statute actually incorporate career and technical education into it because on the ground and with Act 77 originally, it talked about CTE as one of the flexible pathways. So the General Assembly agreed with us, and so they're now under this broader umbrella of Act 77 flexible pathways. So um, there still is a separate section, certainly, because there needs to be given its complexity for career technical education, but the idea was we want to actually make sure that um, these are seen not as kind of competing separate issues. So a flexible pathway would be CTE, would also be adult education, adult basic education. Um, and I know a lot's going on in CTE, and I'm happy to talk at another time about that. I'm happy to talk about anything, mm -hmm. about anything with you all. Um, personalized learning plans was brand new. So um, I, I hope folks have heard of PLPs. Um, they are not the same thing as individualized education plans, which are required by federal law for students who are on um, individualized education plans. That was a, a big piece of professional work we had to do in the field because people were actually conflating the two and saying, oh, they've got a PLP, so they don't need an IEP. And we were like, absolutely not. These are not the same. You know, they're not. Like, there's one is definitely required um, by federal law. PLPs are required by state law, and PLPs are for all students. Um, so that's a really Required, but any idea of how it's going in the field? Um, I think that uh, we, I think it's, it's, uh, um, we do assurances every year, and so largely, uh, meaning like they have to assure that they're seventh through twelfth graders, which is what's in rule, um, actually in law, I believe. That one I have to go back and check. Um, but um, I think it's in law, actually. So the seventh through twelfth graders have to have personalized learning plans. As you might imagine, the first couple of years, they needed a lot of supports to get there. And the first couple of years, it ended up being almost like kind of a checklist, which mm -hmm. was not I great. Did hear that. Yeah. Right? So it was yeah. kind of like, duh, 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 duh. that's not really. The whole point of a personalized learning plan is so that kids are having conversations with adults that can care about them and inform them and actually help them make choices through high school, late middle school and high school, to get to what they're looking for afterwards. So I would say um, certainly COVID, um, you know, COVID, and I know we keep saying this, but it's no, true, that's fair. COVID, that's fair. you know, just put like a, a halt to yeah. a lot of things. Um, so in particular, um, we would, you know, I, I'm very curious to see what our assurance is. And what I, when I say assurances, every superintendent um, has to um, uh, basically sign off and agree to a variety of federal and state um, mandates and laws and obligations. And this is one of them every year. And so they have to say, like, I can assure that all of my 7th through 12th grade students have a personalized learning plan. 
We've never had 100% on that. I think sometimes that's because we've had a lot of um, turnover in terms of leadership, um, as you've probably heard as well at the administrative level. Um, but I think that there's been incredible progress. Um, and so I, I, you know, again, we need to relook at that now that we've been through COVID and see like, okay, this still really is something that's important. We made a lot of um, effort to make it, to ensure that, for instance, you have to have a PLP if you're gonna do dual enrollment because that's how it links to the rest of your um, experiences. If you're doing early college, you should have a PLP. If you are in CTE, you should have a PLP. So we tried to kind of like bring these pieces together from the agency because again, it was kind of just this like checklist thing. Like, okay, at some point they talked about their interests in their four years. That's not really what we were talking about. I think any of us, the General Assembly or the State Board or the, the at the time, Department, right? We yeah, really wanted these to be rich to conversations. Some ownership around their education and, like you said, have some some good conversations with not only faculty, but people outside the building. Uh, and parents. And parents, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, and you might ima as you might imagine, um, I think the more resourced districts had no problem with this. You know, they had the resources to build something new in and kind of go with it. They might have had multiple, um, they might have had multiple school counselors already that could build this into their system. A lot of folks um, ended up um, using um, teaching advi teacher advisories, which has been a really nice model throughout the state, particularly in some of our more rural areas where um, even before our crunch on workforce, um, you know, they weren't able to have, um, maybe not be fully staffed with a full-time school counselor. By the way, it's not guidance counselor anymore, it's school counselor. Um, just so you know. I will make that mistake. Yes. I, I yeah, do sure all the time too. Yeah. Um, and I get that because they do a lot more now than guidance. Um, that's for sure. So curriculum content is the next piece. Is this completely boring you all or is this helpful? I'll be honest, this is this is helpful to me. I don't know if it's helpful, you know, just to understand again this, you know, these eat you know, what what it what is what really does fall. I mean honest I mean, listen, I've only been the chair for a little over two years, so I'm still completely taking it in. Yeah. And this is particularly helpful. Yeah, yeah, good. I just wanted to check in as a teacher because if um, well, it's we have not, I can only a shift. few minutes. Okay. So, yeah. Any kind of. Um, this one is really, I think, important though, because so the and this one can get confusing. So the curriculum content lays out um, here, and this will, I think, change. You'll see um, from what I can tell from what is happening with um, the current um, the deliberation on EQS right now. It's more it's more adding to what's in here and, and flushing out some things. But he, this is where things get a little confusing. And so the EQS say, here's the curriculum content. You have to have literacy. You have to have math content practices. You have to have scientific inquiry and content knowledge. You have to have global citizenship. You have to actually have phys ed and health education. By the way, um, many places do actually do mental health and health education. We can talk about that, because I know that you have some testimony on that. And I'd be happy for us to come back and talk more about that. Arts, um, art expression. Then, on top of that, um, we actually, and this is not in, this is within the purview of the State Board of Education's authority, so it didn't have to come through the state, but the State Board of Education adopted specific academic state standards. So they adopted the Common Core state standards for um, English uh, literacy, ELA, and, um, uh, math and the next generation standards for science and the C3 um, standards for social studies. And so that's a little confusing because that's not listed out in the EQS, but it was part of the deliberative process of um, the state board. And they took testimony and had stakeholder engagement on those as well. Is Common Core listed anywhere in, in this? No, it would be listed in the um, minutes and the meeting logs of the year that we, as okay. a state, um, yeah. adopted them. And so that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, yeah. the rules are not that specific, I think, intentionally. And I don't then, know how teachers keep it. I mean, this, it's... Byzantine. It's just a lot of levels. It's a lot of levels. It's a lot of levels of stuff. It's a lot of levels. 
And I'm not here to endorse nor. No, I understand. This is a, <laughs> does anybody have any questions for Dr. Boucher in terms of what we've heard and a lack of understanding or an understanding now of the EQS? Because I think what we'll hear from, but I think in Dr. Uh, doctor, is it Dr. Kulik or is it Professor Kulik or Senator Kulik? Some people do want to call me doctor or and or doc, but it's just no. There's no there's no doctor. Just I, I think. Uh, I hope this is helpful in terms of understanding some of what you want to talk to the head of St. Johnsbury Academy yes, a little bit about. Definitely. It helps me to understand again, sort of what's there and what what. It, I think it's going to make for a more interesting yeah, and conversation. I don't know to what extent they're even familiar with the EQS. I mean, sure. I really don't. I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't. It well, doesn't stick around. I think. Yeah, it doesn't that. pertain yeah. to them. So, yeah. I mean, they may they may have. It doesn't legally. It doesn't. It doesn't. Right, I mean, right, they have their right. own. Pro there's their separate process, which is they go through NEASC to get approval. Right. Which, this looks Byzantine, but. Well, that's good to know because we have NEASC on our is, agenda, is, <laughs> whether or not you know we know there are eleven public schools that do NEASC. Yeah. Should everybody do NEASC, or should we? You know that kind of. So I have. A, I, I know. I think we're not going to get into it right up. now. No, but yeah. it's. I have them. Yeah. They're in a file in my yeah. office. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone wants to know what they are, yeah. because they're not required. So when they come to me, I have just said, "Great, great, public yeah. school X. I'm just going to have this." And people, they've decided to do that because yeah. they wanted that extra level of. I mean, it it, it is more lab laborious than going through EQS right. to do NEAS. There's no question about it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to do self-studies that are like yeah. pages yeah. long. Yeah. I, I, the colleges, universities, it's something similar, similar yeah. to the National it is. Association. They used to, which now Nietzsche used to be yeah. NEAS, they used to do both. Yeah. All right, maybe I will stick around. Yeah. Sorry. Katie, hey, would down. you <laughs> see if uh, Dr. Howell? My time management seems to stink lately. I feel like I'm You're taking not alone. double my time. No, You're no, not it's alone. very helpful. Dr. Hall, nice to see By you again. I didn't expect you to come in person, but please join us at the table. It's awfully wow. nice of you to come back. Yeah, I just got one too. Hello again. Hi, good yeah. to see you. It's good been, I think, too. a couple of weeks, it has. Uh, it has. and appreciate you coming back. Uh, Senator Gula uh, couldn't be here for the first time you were here. Uh, Correct. And so, uh, and some questions did come up. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was. I think it was probably after your visit around. And Senator Gula uh, can direct these questions better than I. But I think generally around education quality standards yep. and and the academy and, and th those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So am I articulating that pretty well, or do you want to? Sure. I, I don't want to speak for you. Okay. I bet you can do better. Okay, please, go ahead. Senator sure. sure. Kulik, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so I, my question was around EQS. So just generally speaking, um, you know, as a state, we've decided that EQS is sort of the, the model that we live by, sort of our our ethos, so to speak. Um, we don't have a regents exam like New York. We don't have uh, graduation requirements or a mandated curriculum. Um, so this is what we have. And my question to you is, as, as something that we've all agreed upon, that we're all gonna follow this, this set of guidelines, or as I said, ethos, um, how is it or why is it that you that St. Johnsbury doesn't follow EQS. Mm -hmm. You are a school that receives public dollars. We are. Yes. So. Yes. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about how um, about this. Um, so, Dr. Hall, I just yes, want to make sure, sure everybody who's watching understands you are the head of school oh, right now. Yes, the headmaster at St. Johnsbury Academy. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, so, um, I don't know if you've heard from people uh, in NEASC, the accrediting body that um, we had an that overview one NEASC. day of what it looks like. The house, basically. The house yeah. has. Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, we I'm happy too. to talk yeah. about it because yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, and they're, they accredit schools that are tiny and you know Harvard. Um, so they have a lot of um, uh, scope, wide scope in the state. Um, and in New England generally. So 
um, New England, sorry, uh, independent schools um, all over New England trust uh, NIASC. We've been accredited by NIASC. Well, um, it's really quite a rigorous process. So it's on a 10 year cycle. Um, and the first part of the cycle is a self study that every school will do. And it is um, based on 15 standards. Um, that these are the standards that we feel are appropriate for us. They're built for independent schools, um, and they are from operations and employee um, uh, policies to school program. Um, and I'm happy to I'm happy to leave this um, if that's helpful because. That, as a first step, forces the school to actually include a lot of people um, in uh, understanding how they're feeling about how the school is running. Faculty and staff are really important there. So, and then they ask for a lot of material. So they ask for, um, for budgets and for policies and handbooks um, and lots of data and, and that evaluation. So. Um, so then there's a committee formed, a uh, visiting committee. It's usually about 10 people, and it's peers from uh, independent schools. Um, and that committee does two visits. The first visit is uh, really for operations. So I just went, did this uh, down in Massachusetts at the Learning Center for the Deaf in uh, 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 Natick. Um, so you, you go in with a little bit of a smaller group just to talk to facilities and the CFO and the um, admissions and HR to kind of cover the operations piece. Um, and then write a short report. And then a couple of months later, the visiting committee in full comes and spends two days on campus. Um, from pick up to drop off one day, or drop off to pick up, one day just to see how, this, how the school runs and talk to all the constituencies there um, and observe classes and talk to parents. And it, it's really a, a very fulsome. Um, and then the committee goes back, looks at this self-study, thinks about what they've observed and what the data is that they see, um, and then writes up reports. Um, and, uh, and makes really clear and focused recommendations about what, um, what the school might do to improve. Obviously, if, there's, if there are big things that need to be fixed, they're gonna point to that. Um, the school has a chance to respond to, for inaccuracies, not to make their argument. Um, but then that report is completed, and it either adds up to being accredited, being accredited, um, uh, conditionally or being denied. Um, after two years, there's a, another report. It's very brief, but it's really meant to uh, uh, track progress on recommendations. So it, it's looking at those, uh, it's actually 14 standards for us. Um, and just briefly, like, what have you done to address them? The five year report, which we just completed, and actually the AOE, we gave it to the AOE, um, that is more comprehensive and asks us to talk about um, real things that have, have um, you know, that have changed and the ways that we've, um, that we're thinking and planning. It asks for some strategic planning thinking. Um, so that's where we are right now. We submitted that in April of 2022 and I just, Realize that we're going to have to start our whole self-study process in 2025, because then they come in 2026. So, yeah, yeah. Can I please? I, just I hope that was helpful. Yours. No, that was really helpful. Okay. And in 2010, I didn't ask. No, that's teaching, gracious. No, it's okay. I was teaching at Essex High School, and oh, we did the full. So did. I helped write a portion of our of our you know large document that we submitted okay, so I, I'm, I'm very familiar but it was okay. it was a good overview to hear it again so okay, thank good, you good. Yeah. Um, and I think they, they have done some when was it that you 2010 
they have made some adjustments. That's what I've heard. Yeah, um, that's what the I think adjustments they're overall yeah. pretty, yeah. pretty positive. Yeah, it seems yeah. like they're in touch more often now, which I think is a great <coughs> thing. Yeah. yeah, with the school itself. Yeah. After. It used to be like 10 years and then 10 yeah. years, but now it's intermittent. Yeah. Yeah. So how does this all connect then to EQS? Or I mean, it's not really connected to EQS, but it's, I, you know, mm -hmm. it's because as Senator uh, Hewlett said, you don't have to follow the EQS. Uh, it's in, in maybe one way to ask it. Are St. Johnsbury kids not getting something that the public schools are getting because you're not following EQS? That that might be a way for me to think about. Yeah, it. I mean, it's it's. Um, I have no idea because I don't know what's going sure, on in all sure. the schools, um, and I'm not. I am an independent school person, so I'm not an expert on those standards. But I guess what I would say is. Um, they're both, these are both systems of accountability, mechanisms to be held accountable for the things that you're being asked to do um, and the things that you say you do according to your mission. Um, so uh, the EQS, as far as I can tell, um, is a very helpful set of standards for the public schools. Um, and you know, there are a lot of things that we do that are very similar to any, any school and any public school. And, and I've, I really want to be careful not to make it seem like I don't like public schools. I am really, I'm a, I respect and admire and want to work with uh, public schools. But the NEASC accreditation process and that whole set of standards is our accountability mechanism, right? So it's, those are the standards that we have you know, been using. Um, they do need adjustment sometimes. Um, I met with the, I actually met with the State Board of Education maybe in December, um, and they were asking about this, and um, you know, one of the things they were focusing on was the kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion work, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know ethnic studies is a, a piece of what you're talking about these days, um, but they were concerned that we weren't going to be held accountable to these standards that the state had said this is what we want to make sure is happening in every classroom. We want to make sure that, that kids are learning accurate history and that they're, um, they're being, uh, they're belonging and uh, feeling like they belong and they're being treated equitably, right? So, um, so we talked with, uh, with the state board and NEASC was there and, and um, you know, one of the things that was suggested was a Vermont state addendum that could go into the NEASC process um, for Vermont schools um, that really addresses very, very specifically, and we, we would work on it, um, and it wouldn't be sort of wholesale from EQS, I don't think, um, but, uh, but we, we would work on creating an addendum that made sure that everybody felt comfortable, was you know, we, we are accountable to do these things with our students and make sure that our institution is doing um, A, B, and C. So along those lines, one of the things I think you raised was what is happening around maybe I, my mother's memory. I generally remember things that other people say, but I could have this <laughs> wrong. Please, if I'm not accurate. Ethnic studies, DEI, what is happening at the academy? So um, so I, I just want to set the record straight. Please. Um, I don't. I, I'm not sure how this misapprehension got out there, but I, I'm hearing that there's some sense that the academy is refusing to teach ethnic studies. I think there was something, maybe an article that, uh, perhaps a Digger article right? that was also okay. possibly referenced in the committee. You're right. And so I just yeah. want to make, mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah. Does that sound accurate? Your mother's memory is better than mine. <laughs> no, I think, I, I think I'm, now that you mentioned it, I think yeah, that's Yeah, I think that fair. was part of what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember yeah. the feeling, I was like, that's absolutely not, it is just not the case. And, um, you know, we not only teach, I was just talking to my academic dean today saying, you know, um, can I get up to date on what exactly we're doing? And we just approved the AP uh, Black History course and the AP World uh, course that has a new set of standards around um, multicultural um, uh, subjects. So um, we're also, I mean, we really already unequivocally are committed 
to making sure that kids are getting this information and are um, learning how to uh, to find the truth and to speak to each other in ways that are that will get them to um, to the truth. Um, and uh, we also um, want to want to help. Um, our folks who've been on the on the staff for a long time and who have you know reflexes about what they do, um, like hiring um, and like discipline, um, to take a, a look at those processes and policies. And so we we did hire a consultant and for the year, um, and she is looking at across the board um, at everything that we do as a school. Um, and I know there are, uh, there are a few different elements to it. So the policy and practice, institutional policy and practice is one piece. The helping students in the moment to feel that they, like community education, right, around how do we make this the most equitable school, um, faculty, uh, board. And the board is just absolutely all in on this. So I think, you know, you can't really make any progress if you don't have um, some energy from the top, which is why the state standards, I think it's exciting that that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, then, there's, uh, then there's the curriculum. Um, so you know, I think we're looking at all of those things and, and have already made some, uh, some progress in terms of student leadership and faculty leadership. And one thing that I, I appreciate a lot of things about being uh, about an independent school, and I have a lot of them written here <laughs> that, I, that I appreciate. And one of them, the big one really, is the flexibility that we have um, to create programs that respond to whatever it is that we're dealing with in the moment. So I think, uh, you know, there, DEI is sort of a cottage industry right now, so, right? So there are a lot of people who are practitioners. Um, and schools are under a lot of pressure to hire DEI coordinators or, uh, or directors. And um, you know, we're, we're in a very different place. We're in a very, I mean, Vermont is, is very white, uh, but the Northeast Kingdom is particularly white. Um, we have, um, so, and that presents its own, um, own issues, uh, it, but it means really that our, um, our big, ism that, that we're steeped in is classism in the Northeast Kingdom. So this it's socioeconomic diversity that is really the most um, uh, important to, to focus on for us. Um, not to say that racial diversity and all LGBT um, aren't important, because we, we've, we've been working on all of that as well. So, um, so the reason I mention it is because we have some flexibility to hire somebody who is going to be able to focus on what we um, what we want to to create that position, right? And, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. So I just think, from my point of view, where the where the dichotomy sits is that um, many of our schools, public schools, um, I mean. It sounds like your institution, out of you know goodwill, is is deciding to sort of follow the ethnic standards bill and some of the other things, which is fantastic. But there are other schools that obviously um, they don't have the luxury of goodwill, right? They're held accountable to certain standards and certain rules and policies, and I you know I think that there's a bit of a dichotomy there. I also want to speak a little bit to, and I don't want to speak out of turn, so we can get this fact-checked if I'm wrong, and I also don't want to go with a transitive property here, property here, but I do think when the House got testimony from me asked, that one of the questions they asked is, you know, do you, um, do you work with and certify schools that are not, um, do not follow diversity and equity standards and that also may discriminate against LGBTQ students and so forth. And yet he was not able to answer that question. So, um, you know, that's something that, again, in terms of like setting a standard, yeah. I, I, I'm, it doesn't, that doesn't sit well necessarily. I, I understand yeah. that for sure. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that at the State Board we talked about doing the Vermont-specific addendum. And that would be, and um, 
you know, I, I do think that that would cover um, the just what you're talking about, um, and make sure that the Vermont schools that are that are approved by NEASC and accredited by NEASC have this standard to hold schools to. Following up on that, it's correct me if I'm wrong, but that would that be captured in the 2200 series? It would. Okay, yes, I just want to make sure. Yes. Okay, I, and that's how I'm trying to think about it. Yeah, um, is you know that the 2200 series is really meant for the independent schools, and then EQS is meant for public schools. And, and you know, I, I'm not for or against EQS, yeah, yeah. I, because, um, you know, I'm, but I'm for and against standards. Um, so you know, we, the fact that we have these two mechanisms, um, you know, to me, making a transition to EQS is just, it doesn't make sense for us structurally, and also um, just in terms of re, restructuring our, um, yeah, transitioning to a new accountability me mechanism. Yeah, so uh, just to follow up then, because I think you covered this a little bit when you were in, 2200 series is basically saying you cannot take public funds if you're discriminated against mm -hmm. LGBTQ That's stuff. right. And we passed a bill last year that has to be yeah. passed that, you know, we tried to, we heard from some people that that need to be, needed to be stood up mm -hmm. even stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we passed it. Yeah. Um, so I just want to make sure that that that's already there. That that's, that, that is, is yeah, yeah is, is there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind saying a word about admissions, mm -hmm. because the other thing out there, and I think we talked about this a little bit, is can you tell us about the selectivity? I mean, who goes, who doesn't go, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, From the district, I mean, I'm talking about because you serve yes. as a pub, as a as a high school. Yes, and and I do want to mention, and I think I, I just sort of went straight at uh, classism, but we also have 188 uh, boarding students, and many yeah. of them are international students. Um, so we also do have a lot of racial diversity um, that we are attending to. Um, so, um, Senator Fuelik just stands there to make you know, keep an eye on me. Don't, don't <laughs> okay. let it. Don't yes, let it. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Um, so, um, I have some wonderful things written about this. Well, I'll just. Um, we accept all comers. Okay. That is just full stop. Okay. Um, our admissions materials and our application used to ask questions um, that were interpretable as questions that would affect your admission. Um, like, do you have a disability? Um, and how much, you know, what's your socioeconomic status? So they used to, used to um, ask those questions, but now we we have none of those questions basically because it's not it's not a factor mm -hmm. those things are not a factor in our admission they're a factor in enrollment when we want to support a student but mm -hmm. um, essentially you know any student that a public school would take we will take um, only those who are a danger to themselves and others uh, or who have uh, needs that are beyond what we can provide uh, medical needs or um, or other kinds of needs. And those are the, the um, those are the students who I think there's I think that's why the therapeutic schools are also in the um, kind of part of the conversation because they are really really important um, to to us and to public schools. Um, so in in terms of um, uh, admission, I I mean I I don't know what what more there is to say about it. Quite frankly, no, that's, I mean that's we, we that's bring them in and we find. I want to understand the best way to serve them um, and have a special service. If, if special services is kind of at the center of this, which I think it often is, um, we've, we have beefed up our special services in ways that, um, so, so we actually can serve students that we wouldn't have been able to serve five, six years ago um, with the reading and writing lab, but with interventions that are, um, that are very uh, specific with one-on-one -on -one paras. We just didn't have that. Before, so. Additional questions? No, thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Mr. Fanon, you've joined us. 
uh, you pop in sometimes around appropriate uh, times that you might want to weigh in. Do you have some constructive criticism for St. John's Bury Academy? Is that what you're here? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was back. <laughs> Hi. Uh, um, no, thank you. No constructive criticism. No. 100% sure approval rating? <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. in the building and, and right. Right. Totally Yeah, thank you. Okay. Ms. Pelosi? You're, you're here as well. You don't always pop in, but I think the two of you are working together. Okay. Yes, I Great. represent St. John's Berry okay. Academy. Thank you. So. Thanks. Thank you so I much for really having me. Really appreciate you coming back in. Yeah, it does make a difference, frankly, when you can come in in person. Yeah, it's, no, you know, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. As I get to drive in the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Committee at 4 o'clock, we are hearing from the president of the state colleges. Uh, oh, we would love to keep that. Yeah, yeah. please, that's great. Uh, I'm going to pass it right to Senator uh, Lewis. Um, uh, and the provost on the library announcement. So hopefully what we can do is start to pull apart what exactly uh, they're planning on doing. Help us. I know everybody's inbox, uh, some more than others. Is filling up on this issue, so um, we will come back. Yes. Oh, I was going to say, if you want me to squeeze my testimony in right now, I could. Uh, we could also wait. Let's wait five minutes. Is that all right? Sure. I, I want to gear up. I've got Absolutely. a bunch of questions. Yeah. And I wanna, no. I'm going to use the bathroom, and I want to just yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Though. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. All right. We're off. Just the thing is, I'm ready. All right. Welcome back to Senate Education. It's been a nice day. Almost four in the afternoon. To wrap up our day, uh, looking, uh, we have uh, two final agenda items. One is the library at the Mosque College, and then we're just going to hear Senator uh, Hill has been working on a school construction bill that we're going to have a look at and take some testimony on tomorrow, um, and then probably put it down with Friday. <laughs> If not sooner, I'll probably exercise a motion today. Uh, but we are hearing, uh, everybody knows, we read it in the press, I know people's inboxes have been filling up. Concerns and questions about the libraries at the Vermont State Colleges. And to help us better understand uh, their, what's going on, we have uh, the president and the provost. Uh, I don't know why we have underneath here S34. But that doesn't matter. Okay, great, great, great. No problem at all. Just want to make sure I'm not missing something. Mr. President and uh, Provost, are you, are, you, are you there? Yes, I am here. This is Good afternoon. And uh, is the president with you as well? He was just connected. I see that he's disconnected. I would expect him to reconnect here very short, shortly. All right. So uh, welcome, Dr. Atkins, to uh, Senate Education. I think this may be your first time uh, joining us, at least this year. We're pleased to have you. Um, what we're just really hoping for from uh, you and President uh, Burial is an understanding of of really what the plan is with regard to the libraries. Uh, as I may have heard me say, our inboxes are filling up and there's a lot of press. So we're just looking for the, the facts. And if you could provide them uh, to us, that would be great. Yes, I would be happy to, but I see that uh, President Graywall is, is now connected and uh, we'll great. follow his lead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can How are you? Can you hear me? Uh, not really. And we definitely cannot see you. Still there? No, it's not. There we go.
Ah, there we are. President Greywall, can you see us and hear us? He's frozen. Oh, uh, we don't hear you. Can you I don't know if, if it's possible, uh, Dr. Atkins, for you to take the lead on this, given that uh, President Graywall is not coming through. He, I, actually, he's just down the hall. I'm going to go grab President Graywall, and he can uh, come down and, and speak through my connection, if that's OK with, with you all. Sure, sure. OK, just give me a couple seconds. and, and okay. We'll all get connected. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, in the meantime, uh, the question's been asked. Uh, we have a, a nice crowd of folks here. Um, and do you want to just go around and say your name? And maybe uh, if you're connected to the university, or maybe? Yeah, yeah Thomas Randall. I went to Johnson State before I moved in. So oh, I was great. a frequent user of the library. Oh, great, great. Welcome. My name is Peter Christiana. I don't have a connection to the library I'm with BSDA. And that stands for? A Vermont State Employees Association. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Peggy Wesley. I'm with BSDA. Great. I'm Bruce King, also with BSDA. OK. Sir. With the yellow. I'm Brian Morse with VSEA. Great. And Margaret Crowley, first vice president of the SEA. Great. Terrific. Oh. Perfect. Um, Mr. President, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you okay. Uh, sorry for the mishap. I started to join it through my office. Uh, I've been on the Zoom all day, as you know, <laughs> but for some reason, this connection was not working. So probably, sorry for the delay. Uh, would you mind, uh, as we've been talking about, telling us uh, what the plan is for the libraries? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, as you all know that we are undergoing a major transformation and it is uh, through the agreement in, in a way of the select committee report we are building a hybrid university that will be the first statewide hybrid university. The idea for that is to expand access to the university's program and resources services to the students who cannot afford to come and live on campus, who join us through our online programs uh, and through the satellite sites that we have. We serve the entire state with 17 or so sites where our nursing students and in Killington and other places where they join us. So in line with that, we, are, uh, we had announced that uh, we will be building a digital library because uh, to, to align with our strategic priority, but also based on the information that we have gathered that the use of the physical material that include books, include um, other physical material has declined substantially nationally. Now at our university libraries, about 96% of the material that's requested is electronically requested. Only 4% is physically requested. That means physical books, and or uh, other materials. So based on that, uh, our emphasis would be to build our capacity so that we could go serve more students, uh, more staff and faculty and efficiently through a digital library. So that does not mean that we will eliminate all the books or high value materials from the library. As you know that we have uh, donated uh, materials also in the libraries and 
we would keep the most frequently used materials that include books and other items um, in our libraries, but weed out most of the other material that is not being used and have not been used for say last 20, 30 years. Um, by doing so, how we will do that, how we will kind of select what we need to keep. Uh, we propose engagement with our faculty in different departments to determine what is essential for each and every department to serve their students, what academic programs they run. And then we have also proposed that we will work with students, we will work with our campus communities to transform those laboratory, the lab spaces, uh, library spaces to create more learning spaces that could be for individual students and or for them to do group work. We will also enhance technology. We will not only maintain the computers and printers that we provide in the libraries currently, but we will further increase those uh, opportunities. We would also uh, work with you know, co our community to create more like a community commons uh, type of spaces and add student services to the libraries. So it's basically modernizing the library, enhancing access of the library information, the material to all our students, whether they are on campus or not, and keeping certain frequently used materials in the libraries in a, in a smaller uh, portion. Um, that is basically our, our proposal for, for the libraries moving forward. We have a, we have a question, a few questions. I'm gonna start with Senator uh, Bulick and then Senator Hashim. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you for being here today. I, I was a librarian for quite a few years and I, completely understand that weeding is a part of um, good curation of a collection and it's just it's the job of a librarian to do some weeding so when I heard you say that it resonated with me um, we I did a massive weeding at one of my libraries we had books that talk that were written for example about Nixon before Watergate that said what a great guy he was so that kind of book you know it had to go um, we also had books that never circulated they also were taking up really valuable space that I wanted to use for um, student engagement student student interactions we made a maker space for example so I understand that physical books can really take up a lot of space um, having said that I, I don't know if you've spoken to Champlain College, but about, I think it was 20 years ago, they did a massive update of their library and removed almost all of the books and went to a digital um, library. And over the course of some years, they ended up bringing some physical books back in because they, they just saw that there was actually a space for that and a need um, in the community. Um, for students, faculty, etc. So, um, if you haven't spoken with them, I hope you do, because um, I think that would be really important. And I also, I was just hoping you could speak to, it. Are you doing a weeding? Is that what is happening, or is it something bigger than that? I, I, I if you could just speak a little bit more to that, that'd be helpful. Uh, that's a very, very good question, and thank you for the suggestion, especially for me to reach out to Champlain College to, uh, you know, hear their experience with that. Um, um, absolutely, uh, you are correct that weeding is a normal part of the library work every year that is being done on, uh, you know, most libraries. Uh, this project would be... Uh, little bit bigger than just the weeding part that we normally do. Because moving forward, we have to be very conscious because we are under $25 million in structural deficit. Um, we are going to be acquiring more and more or serving students through digital means. 
uh, so the reduction here could be uh, bigger than just the normal V-Day. Um, but it will be in consultation with the faculty. It will be uh, data-driven. That means those materials that are more frequently utilized, relied upon, uh, those would be maintained. And others, uh, we would not uh, uh, continue to keep. Uh, our data also shows that maintenance of our physical resources, the books, is about 30% of the cost of our budget for the library. So that is also kind of the books just sitting there not used uh, are also it is, is a cost. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hashim and then Senator Weeks. Uh, thank you, President Graywell. So I have a whole lot of questions and I don't think I'm gonna be able to fit them in five minutes. So I'll just try to stick with a few. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of confused, is this, so is this expanding the hybridization or is this reducing the library capacity? I'm, I'm kind of unclear as to what, what is actually happening. So we, uh, we are proposing both. Right, we have to expand the digitization, that, that component so that uh, we could provide the materials as more and more students and everybody wants it, wants, wants that material. The second piece is that we have, you know, books from, you know, a lot of books that are not being used. So we will go systematically working with faculty in each department to reduce the number of those books that are not being utilized. So it's kind of two-pronged approach. And since this is kind of an expansion, is this going to be creating more jobs for anyone? So the jobs will shift in a way that less and less physical work, physical maintenance and, and or uh, books that are cataloged in a physical way, but more uh, additions would be more towards the digitization because 96% of our material is requested that way. And we will keep our librarians, every campus will have at least one professional librarian who will continue to serve our students, who will continue to uh, work with faculty. And on top of that, our mission moving forward is also that these librarians work with their faculty to find open access resources to replace the expensive textbooks. As you know, affordability is one of the key components of uh, the new university and the board really uh, highlights that aspect. So we would be reducing the cost of uh, our textbooks by uh, working with faculty in each department, that would be this library. Okay. So is it, so just on the jobs piece, is it safe to say no one's losing the job, their job or getting laid off? Is that safe to say? Um, no, that's not safe to say uh, because we, uh, based on our proposal, uh, we would need to eliminate uh, seven full-time jobs and three part-time positions or, or temporary positions. And those are not professional librarians, but staff that have been supporting this physical work. Um, we have uh, notified them and we have also encouraged them to apply for jobs within the institution that are currently open and uh, jobs that we will be opening as we move forward with our staffing decisions. And Please. one last question. Uh, from the viewpoint of the students, uh, what, what type of weight are you giving their views when it comes to this decision? Right, so uh, I we have uh, gotten uh, information from the students. We did a, a small survey of the students, um, but more importantly, I've been going to every campus and listening to the students and the faculty and staff about this decision. Uh, most students that I have spoken to, they have highlighted that 
Um, the ambient of the library is important. The use of that space is important for them. Sometimes not even, you know, reading the books, but to do their work. But they have also highlighted that I need a physical book. I learn better with a particular, you know, physical uh, material. So, uh, and some have highlighted that I have uh, some learning disability. I don't do as well using uh, digitized material. So we have, I have heard them and our response to that is that we are going to be keeping uh, most important, most commonly used books for every discipline. We would also, uh, by law, also required that we have to meet if somebody has a disability uh, to, if they need a physical book, then we would provide that physical book to them. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, Pre Mr. President. So uh, just, uh, well, first off, thank you for the overview. It's very helpful. If you can articulate just uh, briefly what you intend uh, that the current library facility will evolve into uh, if this plan moves forward. Right. So um, as you can imagine, the, the library will still look like a library. The library building, we want to keep it as a library and call it as a library as well, library and learning center perhaps, and a librarian will be in there as well. So the new configuration of the space would be finding uh, nationally renowned renovations that have occurred in different libraries and coming up with um, better places for students to learn. Individual students, group students, uh, putting in more technology, innovate, innovative uh, spaces, and uh, uh, creating a community commons type of environment. Uh, it will stay as the heart of the campus on each campus, uh, and it will actually further attract students to these spaces. Uh, in the library. They will be able to access the physical books that will still be there, but at the same time connect digitally and uh, do their work as, as they uh, tend to do. Uh, one student uh, sitting in uh, Castleton the other day when I just finished a session with the students in person, uh, sent me an email that I'm sitting in Castleton Library right now, and I have logged in more hours than any other person in this library because I use it so much. Uh, but yes, I agree with you. He told me that uh, this space needs to be, uh, innovation is needed. We need to improve uh, the library. Thank you. <clears throat> are, are the hours of operation going to stay the same? Uh, is the alum, alumni still going to be able to access those physical boards? Um, yes, absolutely. We will keep the library hours open because, as you know, residential students also come and you know and go in and out. Uh, another part to the library is hiring lots of work study students who work in these places. Uh, we would not only maintain those positions, we would actually expand the number of students that could be hired in different departments. That's one of our other goals because we know uh, students that actually get employment on the, library, uh, on the university campus, they have a higher success rate. They are retained better, they graduate on time, uh, they get uh, lots of applied learning experience. Thank you, President Greenwald. You're welcome. Any other questions right now or concerns as it relates to this issue? Mm -hmm. You're good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we appreciate your time uh, and you know better understanding the situation. I think we'll leave it there for now. And then, uh, of course, if anything else arises, uh, if we have a question, we will certainly reach out to you and your staff. Right, ab absolutely. And uh, as you can imagine, this is a, uh, one of our uh, major decisions. It's a hard decision. And you know that we have to make uh, some hard decisions in order to meet uh, our, our budget cut requirements as well. 
Uh, we are using this opportunity to address both issues in a way of realigning the budget, but also enhancing the space and student experience, enhance accessibility and affordability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, you all too. Bye-bye. Vince, I did see that they have the Luzi papers that were <laughs> stored at Johnson up for sale on, <laughs> on eBay. I went in at two dollars. <laughs> but time will tell. <clears throat> thank you. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, why don't we, uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, here. Here you go. This I is, uh, some documents. No, no, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I think the library closure is something we could talk about a bit more. But okay. Like, look, um, it's disconcerting to know there's a dozen or so people um, who are probably going to lose their job. Um, and from a lot of students who voice concern, yeah, it's. I think it might be worth discussing a little bit more. Is yeah, sure, something. sure. Happy to. Yeah. Uh, if you have somebody in particular that you'd like to hear from related to that, <clears throat> I mean, one thing I can just tell you from where I'm sitting, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and I don't know if the committee agrees with this or not, I mean, we, we generally don't legislate, yeah. right. you know, get involved with the day-to-day -day operations. For example, UVM, last year, the year before, we limited, eliminated certain programs right. in the liberal arts curriculum. There was a push for us to intervene and say, hey, what, you know, we need those programs, the Latin program, whatever it was, and we didn't. So that's what I hesitate. That being said, if there are people that you would like to hear from on this issue that would be helpful, <clears throat> please. Yeah, I mean, if the door is <clears throat> closed from us possibly legislating anything to keep the libraries as they are and help them expand, then yeah. I, wouldn't want to waste time, but if there's something that we can do, potentially, could be worthwhile exploring. Uh, as is. Yeah. <clears throat> as is, but also, yeah. also, you know, trying to go along with what the president's trying to accomplish, because yeah. uh, I think it makes sense to also expand hybridization, uh, which is great for students who are on different satellite campuses or yeah. far away from a library, um, but I mean, you know, the, yeah. One I, I, question that wasn't asked was, how much are you saving? That's that I, I was, meant to ask. I thought that was going to come from you. I didn't ask. He, you, he did say twenty-five million, million in deficit. deficit. That's what. So, that was his answer. Yeah. Not that he quantified this particular line yeah, item. But he has a twenty-five million dollar deficit, yeah. which we well know. So how much is this going to save? What? Well, I said you could give him some money. Yeah. 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 Well, that's part of what you're wondering. Right? Right. I mean, yeah. is there a way for us to work with them to kind of keep? It, keep the employees there and still be innovative, et cetera. That's kind of what you're. Yeah, that's that's, <clears throat> yeah. that's what I'd like to explore. A yeah, bit. yeah. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to just say, you know, I, I don't want to tell the president, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Right. I right. want to right. try working and collaborating to figure out what we can do. Yeah. I don't want to grandstand. Yeah. But you right. would right. like to repeat. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that he that the president mentioned his 96 percent of material all being. Uh, retrieved electronically. To me, that resonated. That's not right. something I'd heard before sure. today, now. But anyway, uh, that's just something to reflect on. Yeah. Wait, repeat that. What, what was it exactly? Ninety-six percent of materials at the at, at the library mm -hmm. were electronically retrieved, not physically retrieved. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that was, that's what that. I don't. I don't want to profess to have any answers, but I do. Last I knew, there was a dearth of. Um, school librarian so I'm, I'm not again I'm not <coughs> saying this could be a solution but there is a possibility of other jobs possibly available out in the ecosystem mm -hmm. for librarians who just yeah visit. maybe within yeah. their own campus too maybe yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right I don't, know, so just yeah. I don't have a line in the sand or anything with this yeah, I just yeah, think no, it's, yeah. it's based on feedback the very energetic feedback I've gotten from people yeah. like, that it just seems um, yeah you might, uh, if ask, and I, again, wish I had. It, it, it sounds like you can apply, so you're, you're losing your job, but you can apply for a new position. Yeah. Is there anything they can do to sort of help that transition? Are we talking about you know a big pay cut if you take a different position? That kind of thing might be also yeah. interesting. To kind of 
Yeah. So I think I think which typically happens is the rumor got out there. There was an overreaction, maybe some misinformation. I think what I heard today really clarified yeah. what's going on. The physical building is going to stay there. It's going to be open. People can still go in and take books out. And he's repurposing the books that are that are going to be pulled out of there. He's going to, he's going to donate them, from what I read, to other libraries in the area. So. And I believe, Senator Gulick, you sent a link to the BPR piece. I haven't heard it, but I think he might pull it. Very much the same. Very much the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, take this hot seal. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce yourself for the record. <laughs> Senator Hewlett, uh, Vice Chair, Senate Education. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm here. You have a copy of um, a, it's not even complete yet, but it's a beginning draft that. Um, Rebecca Wasserman has been helping me with. Um, and it was sort of created at the behest of uh, the state, our treasurer, and some other folks. Um, because I, guess, I guess Vermont Digger isn't interested. I know. No offense. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but, uh, it's yeah. I'm sure he's just going home to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tune back. Yeah. No, it's OK. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I'm pretty passionate about school buildings. Um, I feel that at the very least we need to have safe, accessible buildings for our students and our faculty and staff who are sometimes the biggest employers in our regions. Very often they are actually. Um, so safe, accessible, good air quality. Um, we could go on and on. Lighting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, this is where, this is sort of where this is coming from. Um, I do want to re remind you all that we had really good testimony from Rhode Island as um, a model of one way to sort of crack, crack this nut and get things moving. And I don't know about you all, but I was pretty daunted by the work that they have had to do to, to really fix their schools. I mean, it seemed like a massive undertaking that takes years and years. But it seems like they are making progress. And so yeah. as much as I was daunted by that testimony, I was also sort of excited and, and you know, just looking forward to how we could maybe try to make it work for us or make parts of it work for us. So. I mean, Act 72 is something that's already in place, and if you haven't read it, I recommend that you do because it, it lays out a lot of work around school construction and we had a walk through. what it will look like, yeah. Um, so the piece that was missing really was around the task force, which is an important piece of the work. So you can read this, uh, feel free to read it, but my question to you really at this point is, if you look at the makeup of the task force, you know, who's missing? Who would you like to see on the task force? Um, I think that's something that maybe we should think about and consider. Yeah. And then I was hoping, and I think the treasurer agrees with this, and hopefully the secretary of education agrees that this task force may, might even be able to start getting together and convening this summer so that in October, when that bill comes out, people can sort of hit the ground running and really start digging into the, the meat of the work. Um, so what does the task force do exactly? Is well, that looking for funding? Is it? The yeah. ta it's, it's in here, but the task force basically will take that report that comes out in October. And go. Yeah, and really run Where with it goes. on all the various so levels. To develop like a strategic plan? Or? Yeah. I know, I know. It's big I work. Thought the, I thought that the report was going to be kind of a strategic plan, no? The Act 72 report? It will have some of that, and it'll have a lot of findings in it. Yeah. But the, strate the, the um, task force is, well, what we heard from Rhode Island, right? That group, and they have a really massive group with all kinds of, I mean, you guys remember, there's like, I don't know, like the governor and senators and reps and 
all kinds of folks in the community, and um, they meet regularly to to do everything from look at the needs, you know, who is at the top of the list for needs and if that should change and what kinds of accessibility uh, requirements need to go in or don't need to go in. You know, they're all weighing in from their various points of view on, on how, how to tackle the problem. So that is, and frankly, it's something that our treasurer really wants, so I feel like we should probably go with that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just concerned that we may be re reproducing effort. Is, is there anything in Act 72 that lays this out? I think this is what maybe is missing from Act 72. Right. Is that accurate? It okay. might have been a, either a, maybe an oversight on the legislature's part or something, but it sounds like Rhode Island has this yeah. piece, and it was essential, and Act 72 doesn't have this group of people, correct me if I'm wrong, that would take the plan and kind of run yeah. with it. Yeah, and I wasn't here when Act 72 came into being, but um, was it modeled? Was this modeled after Rhode Island? I, you know, I don't remember hearing don't any testimony. So. I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. So I do think the task force is a piece of the Rhode Island process that, yeah. I like it, we, but the concern I got is that... You just want to make sure we don't do that. Right. Well, yeah. not only that, but um, I, had, I had my, my barber is on the school board yep. in, the, in the local school district. He said he's just he's concerned about the evaluation when it comes out. Who's going to pay for it? How? how oh, gonna, sure, no question. That, I mean, we're all right. yeah, absolutely. So, and, it, and how are you going to prioritize which school needs it more than the other, the next? Right. Um, so exactly. that task force yeah. has a good mission for that. Yeah. Too. And I think we'll see in Act 72, I could be wrong, we could ask the Ledge Council, we'll see like a prioritization of um, like what buildings I think need it first right. and foremost. And by the way, next week we are going to hear from the Agency of Natural Resources and Energy, Matt Chapman's going to be in for an update on where things are with PCB testing. And as you'll learn, it's Well, that's his concern. Yeah. Right. If, if they find PCBs, yeah. how are we going to pay to yeah. uh, mitigate it? Yeah. Or yeah. So I guess my ask to our committee is just to really be thinking about who should be on the task force and um, make sure we sort of really think deeply about do we have all the right stakeholders in there and is there anyone else that we should be thinking about. And we're going to hear from the bees tomorrow on this. So that will also be helpful. The bees? The bees. The Vermont Association of Principals, Superintendents, and that's what we generally <laughs> and they have a copy of this? Yeah, we'll sure yeah. they have a copy of this. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Uh, thanks. How did I do? Thanks. Good. Yeah? First time? All right. So we're done. We're done.